Good afternoon, everybody. Appreciate everyone coming out an hour early and uh, charging with this ambitious agenda tonight. But I think that with uh, good effort on our part, we can stay on track, even though we're starting about five minutes late. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to go into our 54th special session. So moved, Mayor. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor of going into special session, please say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Looks like we're in special session. The first item is uh, to consider approval of an ordinance authorizing the transfer of 19 to 23 West Antietam Street. Mr. Mayor, I hereby, Mayor and Council, I hereby move for the Mayor and Council to approve an ordinance authorizing the transfer of property located at 19, 21, and 23 West Antietam Street in Hagerstown in accordance with all terms and conditions outlined in the purchase agreement. Second. Motion made by Mr. Munson, second by Mr. Mensner. Any discussion? Uh, yeah, I just want to make this comment. Um, I think uh, this is long overdue, but not only that, um, it's also a very good first step in our efforts, the city's efforts, to start to clean up Antietam Street. Uh, this should be the beginning of something big, I think. And I would like to th thank the staff uh, who put an awful lot of work and effort into this thing, awful lot of wheeling and dealing uh, for their effort as well. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Motion carries. Ordinance is approved. Next item is the approval of a resolution authorizing an economic development incentive in reference to the agreement to purchase 1923 West Antietam Street. Mr. Mayor, hereby move for the Mayor and Council to approve a motion authorizing an economic incentive paid to Bowman 2000 LLC equal to half the amount of the total demolition cost of 1923 West Antietam Street or $75,000, whichever is less. This economic incentive is subject to the terms and conditions of the attached resolution and economic incentive agreement. The source of this incentive is the Economic Redevelopment Fund. Second. Motion made by Mr. Metzner, seconded by Mr. Munson. Any discussion? Just a comment. Um, I guess it's my turn to comment on, on this issue. And I've said it for some time. We don't need to tear down downtown. That's certainly not what I advocate, but I certainly believe that we need to tear down the ugly parts of it. And I think that it will actually make us money over time to strategically spend our resources removing these buildings of blight from our downtown so that the good buildings that remain and the ones that, that are in flux and in question can be built up uh, by removing the ugly from uh, the blocks. And I guess this would be a good time to remind folks that 1923 is the building that was burned and was partially demolished before last winter, uh, and that the $75,000 in this uh, incentive is really going towards the purchase of demolition so that that property can be used otherwise. So, any other discussion? And, well, and if the Bowman Group were not doing this, it would cost us about $150,000 to tear it down. To do, yeah, which it needs to be demolished before the winter sets in and snow creates even more structural hazards. Right. Yeah. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Motion carries. And the resolution is approved. One more item. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the presentation from the Fine Arts Museum Board will occur probably around four o'clock. There was a, some confusion about the schedule. So they will will recognize them or allow them to recognize us as soon as they arrive. Uh, but with that, we'll adjourn our special session and move into the work session. And I uh, have a proclamation for Municipal Government Works Month. Who here would like to accept that proclamation on the city's behalf? Well, Mr. Dyke. Public Works, that's a... Our Public Works work, Director? Our worthy recipient this time of year. Streets have never looked better. Well, thank Thanks. That's right. <laughs>
I know we're going to approve your snow removal budget uh, next week. <laughs> this, is a, this is a proclamation for Municipal Government Works Month. And of course, we have several staff people here who keep the city running uh, on a daily basis, and all of them do very good work, and we're appreciative of over, uh, what, what are we at, about 430-some uh, total employees that make Municipal Government Works. Whereas the city of Hagerstown was incorporated in 1762, and whereas Maryland is home to 157 municipalities, and whereas municipal government represents the most responsible level of government, allowing citizens to have direct access to elected officials, and whereas in an effort to educate citizens about municipal government and the importance of their participation, the city of Hagerstown is proud to promote municipal government awareness, and whereas municipalities have enhanced the quality of life for their respective residents by providing excellent community-based services, and helping to make Maryland a great place to live, work, play, and explore. Now, therefore, with the support of the City Council, I, David Geisbert, the Mayor of the City of Hagerstown, hereby join the Maryland Municipal League in declaring the month of November 2014 as Municipal Government Works Month in Hagerstown, Maryland. Thank you, Mr. Public Works Director. Would you like to say any words on behalf of the... Uh... It's, a, it's a group effort, it's a team effort. It's not just one person, it's the entire city that makes it happen. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh, right. photo. And I'm looking forward to the, uh, speaking of municipal awareness, doing the uh, If I Were Mayor essay contest with local elementary school kids. I'm sure, I know Mr. Brubaker's on that. And Any other staff want to get Eric's picture? Oh, he's up there. <laughs> it's always good to make kids aware of the, uh, the workings of government. And you know what, I tell you what, fourth graders really understand it too. You ask them, why do you have government? They, they know all the answers, so uh, it's good to make people aware. Uh, the other uh, next oh, item on the agenda, I'm sorry? Are you good to go, Andrew? Oh, okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the holiday pop-up shop event. And we are grateful for our downtown manager, Andrew Sargent, and for Rory Dautridge, and Jackie Beach, Jackie Beach Walker. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. Sure, sure. Very excited to hear about this weekend's event and what's in store. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as you know, as you're well aware, that we are having uh, uh, there will be another pop-up shop event in downtown Hagerstown this weekend, starting Friday evening. And again, we have members of the downtown movement, Jackie Beach Walker and Rory uh, Dautridge, to tell us a little bit more about what is uh, specifically going to happen this weekend and what we can all look forward to. Um, we're very excited this time to have a lot of um, support and um, special things going on from the businesses already existing downtown. Um, so I just wanted to mention a couple of things um, that, that are going on um, from businesses that are already existing, like some of the restaurants um, such as El Paso and the Broadax, um, Gourmet Goat, Greens and Grains, Rhubarb House, Flying Pie, Always Runs. Um, they're having some specials um, to coordinate with the pop-up shop event, like um, discounts off of entrees. And um, then there's the Potomac Bead and Bickles that are having special sales that coincide with the pop-up shop. Um, and we're going to have Crumpies back um, with Bickles. And we're going to do a hot chocolate stand and have donuts. So really excited to have the support from businesses that are existing and excited to work with us um, for the pop-up shop event. Do you have the same businesses coming back this time in addition to new ones? Mm -hmm. we, we do, we have we had probably 95% of the businesses come back and the businesses that didn't come back just felt that they weren't right for the holiday shopping market like um, the workout classes and, and we have a toy store in there this time but we had 95% participation and then we added um, another 10 really exciting shops. Wow. So um, how many total now this time? It's 24. 24. But that's not including the um, gifted market where um, we're going to have the artist market and then um, the Santa's Alley, and that's 35. Wow. Um, either independent artists, local entrepreneurs, um, or um, independent consultants. So we're nice. really excited about when that. When Santa's Alley, you say? We're calling it, yeah, Santa's Alley. <laughs> is that the same as the artist's uh, market, it's, market um, in it's, the old it Susquehanna is in the same Bank? building. Okay. Yep, one will just be to the left and one will be to the right. Okay, great. 
And um, Jax also has some activities that we have that are going to coincide and then um, yeah, we're also working with Anderson Photographs to do pictures with Santa, oh, nice. as well as um, families can schedule sessions to get their family portraits done. Um, we have horse-drawn carriage rides, carolers, gift wrapping stands, um, the coat drive. We're doing a coat drive for the Ruth Ann Monroe Primary School, so that's happening um, in conjunction with the event as well. Um, and then the don't talk about the window competition or. Yeah, we're just we had the shops work with the um, uh, the downtown alliance so that they're sort of on board with decorating their windows for the holidays and they're getting sort of competitive which is cool to see them get excited um, and then on some of the storefronts where the carriage rides will go and where people will be walking we have um, local um, downtown movement committee members have painted um, on the front of some of the buildings that you actually we can't get into to put a pop-up mm -hmm. so to keep it looking festive and sort of exciting did you say carriage rides carriage rides horse drawn Wow. Yeah, we're excited. <laughs> With sleigh bells ringing? They do have a bell and a little lantern. Because, I mean, 5.30, it's dark now. Yeah, so. it is. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And, um, and I have the... the a passport again if you guys want to look at it with the map of where the shops will be uh, most are in the same locations we are across Franklin now um, in the old space um, across from Lena Darner's um, and if you guys want oh in the old fat cat space um, if you guys want to take a look <laughs> so it kicks off this Friday at four o'clock the shops will be open at four o'clock mm -hmm. uh, so they'll be open for people before and after the uh, tree lighting on Friday night and then they open again on uh, at on noon on Saturday, noon to 8 p.m. on Saturday, and then on Sunday uh, it'll be from noon to six. Mm -hmm. And then how many? The, so there's an encore weekend to, mm -hmm. to for the, the following weekend, uh, Saturday and Sunday, of uh, uh, after Thanksgiving, uh, for the hours on on the 28th on Saturday is. Well, nine it's to Friday seven. and Black Friday oh, and Small Business Saturday, sorry, nine to six both yeah, days. Yeah, nine to six yeah. both days. So, to, so and, uh, most of the vendors are coming yeah, back for the Encore weekend. It's, it's all the um, shops that we have filled, they're all staying. So uh, in some of, um, most of the um, market will be um, returning. We just have a couple that are in sort of the grand space and in the fat cat space, we have like a few different vendors in one. We have a couple that won't be there the next weekend, but all of the spaces will still look full. And um, right. yeah, and they're gonna sort of, we'll be there, we'll help, there won't be as much of the- um, Volunteer presence. There, volunteer presence as well as like the horse-drawn carriage rides. We still will have Santa, but the, the shops are willing to sort of fend for themselves and see how it goes. I mean, we'll still promote on Facebook and sure. do, but they're kind of excited. Uh, we have a few shops that are actually using this as a um, sort of a test. Mm -hmm. um, some of our new shops are, came to us because yep. they're looking to come downtown and wanted to kind of have this as their, as their trial. Great. trial. Yeah. If people wanted to find out more about this online, mm -hmm. what would be the best way for them to find it? I know you're on Facebook. We're on you Facebook, and we definitely movement. are the most active on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, we also have our website, which is downtownmovement.org. Okay. So. Thank you. Is there a uh, repeat the days and times, including this weekend mm -hmm. and the days after Thanksgiving? I mm -hmm. want to emphasize that. Could you repeat those, please? Yep. It's this Friday, um, November 21st, 4 to 9. Um, November 22nd, Saturday, 2, 12 to 8. Um, November 23rd, 12 to 6. That's and a Sunday. That's the Sunday. Okay. Yep. And then the and next then the weekend, next right Black after Thanksgiving. Friday, yep. Black Friday is 9 to 6. And then Small Business Saturday is 9 to 6. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Keep up the great work. <laughs> it's very exciting stuff. <laughs> you yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I, I, I hesitate to say this because it's kind of tongue-in-cheek, but uh, the downtown movement popped up at right, the right time. <laughs> oh. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> it just reminds me, when they had the sort of the gathering after the first downtown uh, movement pop-up shops, that young entrepreneurial women are at the heart of this movement, and I don't think that can go unnoticed. So I hope they keep up the good work. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is our preliminary agenda review. Councilmember Nye has the invocation next week. Mm -hmm. 
And um, just to go over our meeting schedule for, oh, and also to remind folks, we will have an executive session at 5.30. So we'll start at 5.30, uh, and then we'll have our regular session at 7. Our calendar for December, we will have work sessions at 4 p.m. on the 2nd and 9th. Our regular session will be on Tuesday the 16th, and there'll be no meeting on the 23rd. And then our first meeting in January is the 6th. And I think we'll, uh, yeah, we also meet with the delegation on the 9th, uh, just prior to our work session over at the USMH building. Uh, if you're planning ahead, and I think we'll get the, the draft calendar for 2015 out to you sometime this week before we approve that sometime the beginning of December. Um, we have a couple of appointments and many more to come uh, for boards and commissions. We have a few guests. Um, on the consent agenda, there, um, did we get the, a memo for, there was one more item we were going to add to uh, the consent agenda, which is an agreement with CenturyLink, so uh, there may be one more item to be coming on that. Yeah. And Rodney, I, have you got that? Okay. Maybe Jim's coming in. Jim talked to the mayor and me this morning about an agreement with CenturyLink. The, um, any questions on the consent agenda? We have the Western Maryland Blues Fest uh, budget. Uh, we have the contract for snow abatement. Any questions on those two with the DCED? In public works, there's a couple of vehicle replacements. Yeah, did everybody else get about 15 yes. copies in that time? We were just making sure you were reading carefully the text. Yeah, we, yeah. yeah, we, we that did. Was a, that was a test. The copy machine went nuts. Too. That's right. Um, so yeah, there's, a, <laughs> there's a, I think, a total of three vehicle replacements. One in public, two in public works, one in utilities. Any questions about the public works, vehicles? How about utilities? We have a vehicle replacement, fire hydrants, chlorine regulators, and the Edgemont Dam engineering services. Any questions on those? And then in the police department, the community-based prosecutor and uh, overtime services with the Washington County Sheriff's Office, which I believe is grant funded. Yes. And then, of course, we'll get more information on that agreement with CenturyLink. And, uh, of course, if there's any questions about that, as you get that information, please contact staff. Under new business, we'll have our, um, an ordinance to accept the conveyance of the park out of Collegiate Acres to the city. We'd like to take a minute on that one. If we could. Okay, sure. Well, we did talk about it back in the spring where we kind of, we did pass a resolution of our intention to take this over. The park is now finished. So the, it'll be a fee simple conveyance of the property to the city. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions about that. The one thing we could use your input on is what you'd like to name the park. Um, and we can include that in the action that you would take next week. The suggestions were Terrapin Park, Legion Park, Mountain View Park. We kind of like Terrapin Park, but that's up to you all. <laughs> Does anyone have any strong opinions about that? There are going to be some turtles in it. Yes, that's actually the plan to get some of those turtles that kids can climb over those kind of things. Sounds good. It's not really a park that you would name after a historic figure. Or it's more of a neighborhood park. Though. Sure. That's and it fits with the the road that it's on and the exactly. collegiate it's on acres. It's on Terps Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds good. Terrapins Park it is. All right, any other feedback on that? We also have the Heal Cities designation. Uh, that's in our agenda today to go over as well. Um, does anyone have any questions on that before we? We'll talk about it more later. We have the user agreements with the American Little League, uh, Police Athletic League, the YMCA, and Hazel for property over at the Fairgrounds Park. Any questions about those? I think 
The user agreement for the American Little League is for fairgrounds? They have a user agreement with us that obviously is for their main facility uh, down off of Frederick Street. Mm -hmm. um, and then in that was also to use the field at the very north end in Fairgrounds Park is shown in the That's packet. the one they're giving up? Right, they're giving that one up. They're and really giving it up? Okay. Well, they'll be able to use it. Powell's going to, if we pass all this, Powell will be the main user, but yeah, they will I be able that. to use and it. And when I talk to the guys with the Police Athletic Club, because mm -hmm. I know that the American Little League, that, that field was given to them, and I mm -hmm. think that that was during um, Sager, I believe, when he was. And I know that... I have no problem with the Police Athletic Club mm -hmm. doing what they need to do, but I really would not like to see the right of American Little League mm -hmm. be taken away. I think it was a maintenance issue primarily. Well, it was a maintenance issue because all of, the, all of baseball is really struggling, mm -hmm. and American is struggling more than anyone, and that was supposed to be the minor league field. And because of not having parent participation, because it's lack of, that's the reason it had just gone south. I'm not blaming anyone. I think. No, that, I'm just yeah. saying that's that's. But I, when I talked to them, I said, you know, the understanding is is that I feel that if the police athletic club gives it up, that it should revert back to American Little League if they so if they choose to take it back. Yeah, down the road. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's the stipulate. It was given to them. Mm -hmm. Irrigation and everything was put in by them. Mm -hmm. Is it the intent of how to develop um, comparable uh, competitive youth baseball? Um, um, not so much youth uh, baseball. They're interested activities. in girls softball and developing um, some other activities like that. Um, what, what they envision is working with us to have the field used every night of the week. And some nights it would be used by PAL for some of their activities. Some nights we could rent it out. Some nights it could be used for some of the city's recreation activities. Some nights it could be used by American Little League. Just instead of going from not being used at all to being used frequently. That's be, the vision. Yeah, and before when um, Kel Ball was involved, when he had children in Little League, that's when he also used the field and maintained the field. Mm -hmm. It seems like national and American, I think, have struggled in recent years for, uh, you know, uh, adequate share. levels of participation, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. and it would seem odd if Powell was taking it over to sort of establish a third. No, they're not. You know what I mean? Not directly competition with the yeah. leagues. They're not doing that. It's to, yeah. it's to continue that what they do, their program to reach out to the community to yeah. help kids. But primarily, they want to use it in the summertime. So I think it'll fit in with the American Little League if they want to use it in the spring during their program. Okay. Any other questions on those? We also have approval of the open project, uh, program open space projects. Uh, it's also on our agenda tonight. Uh, naming Alley 5-55 as Marguerite Way. Any questions on that? It's a very nice letter it's from the, nice thing. the uh, relative. And we also have the general fund agency contribution policy. We've previously gone over. We, we did, I guess I'm a little fuzzy on, on uh, item G, uh, remaining on that, uh, I guess, guaranteed list. I don't recall that. Hold on a second. Could be wrong. I, that was a long discussion, so where it shook out, I can't say it. See, item G? Yes. HDMP. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I kind of thought the same thing when I saw that. Uh, that was the, it's what is it, $47,000 mm -hmm. currently? Yes. Was there a consensus to remove that agency from the... I guess we would call that a core agency. I thought that was a consensus reach, but I could be wrong. Like I said, I don't remember that. Yeah, I think we'll have to go back and look at the minutes. And get yeah, you have to go back and look at the minutes because I think that with that whole development is that it kind of reverted back to um, the original program. 
what was the original the program? The home store. The home store. Mm -hmm. So. If I, I, I agree, we should go back and look at it. My, my recollection, and being a senile old man, I wouldn't put a lot of faith in it, was that we were agreeing to continue to fund G, but in a separate category than A through F. That it wasn't, it wasn't one of those fundamental guarantees, but we Of this source. Of this source, yeah. Right. I, 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 think the, I think there was an acknowledgement we were going to fund it, but mm -hmm. that it wasn't going to be included in this list. But that's, like I say, if we go back and take a look and see, I think that's the best way to do it. And we'd be happy to do that. Um, is the 190, my, my recollection is that we, you, you were pretty comfortable with the dollar amounts at that time because you were trying to lower Mm -hmm. The funding a little bit. You've got 190 for those agencies, 10, at least the way this is worded, for other agency requests, and then five for contingency. So it was 205. Does that does that sound right to people? Yeah, those figures ring a bell. I'm, I just 205. Yeah, there. but and Kristen, I agree with you, and you too, Lou, because I didn't. I thought that those. <coughs> Because if they, if you, F were the only ones that were discussed, and I don't remember where the home store went to. Because the point is, if you pull G out, what, which which category is it going to? Where's it going to fit? I, you, you've got flexibility. Like I don't remember, like I, said, I don't remember the. You've got flexibility under the 190 to decide how you want to allocate that funding. But if you take G out into a separate category. We don't have a funding amount earmarked for a separate category. Right. Correct. And, and my notes actually had H and D P lumped in with the with the total of one ninety. Okay. That we said that we That's, wanted it, the policy to literally say seven seven right. core, a total of one ninety, and then in each of those instances no guaranteed amount would be like the library wouldn't necessarily receive the same amount each right. year. We, we but, decided right. the funding with the discussion was right. Right. not part of that. And it, and it is helpful for finance okay. to know now only from the standpoint they're That's sending fine. letters out to yeah, agencies. I mean, I think the amount's fine. And, yeah, yeah, I think Michelle's recollection is much better than mine. I'm glad that your young mind's <laughs> working that. You now. got it. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Michelle. So it's okay to leave it on the list, but then mm -hmm. you all will be able Understand. to decide how much to distribute mm -hmm. or allocate amongst Within those. Within the 190. Seven. Understand. Within the 190, and then yeah. it is, is the policy um, has there, the 10,000 would be for all the other miscellaneous ones, right. and then leaving an additional 5,000 of that is just um, unspecified, so that throughout the year we still right. had a little bit of flexibility. Right. Understand. Not lots, but. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay. Did you want to should we point out our trusty clerk has found it in the minutes? In the draft. This is in the draft of the minutes. Mr. Zimmerman summarized the discussion as follows. Seven core agencies have been identified that will be funded annually. These seven agencies will be required to complete the application, which will show the mayor and council how they will use city funding. There will be 190000 included in the budget for these seven agencies. The mayor and council will determine the amounts for each agency at a later date. There will be 15000 included in the budget for aid, other agency funding, with $2,500 uh, for any one individual agency. The other agencies will be required to submit an application in order to be considered for funding. And then I think we, we came, that's when Metz, Mr. Metzner suggested the reserve of 5000 for unexpected funding requests. Um, so that's, that's what the minutes say. Sounds good. Yep. All right, thank you. Let's see the next item. On the preliminary, uh, where are we? The contract with Gov HR for City Administrator Search Services. Any I, questions on that? I would assume we're going to pull that for an individual vote. Yeah, that's under new business. Okay. Um, get my pile straight here. The next item is bulk gasoline purchase. Any questions on that? Oh, okay. And the next item is diesel fuel. I think the clerk. Would you like to? Here's one for you. For me. Thank you. Are we? Are we past the gasoline one? 
We just we just were on the bulk gasoline, and now we're on diesel fuel. I, item L. I just had a comment on the gas one. Mm -hmm. The same on this one too. Mm -hmm. I, I'm only. Right. What's that? It's a little under. Well, I'm just I, I, just a note doing the math. I mean, it, it's while I understand that the dynamics of it clearly. Uh, it's about a half a million dollar contract, uh, and I, it looks like you know, in, in joint with the county. But uh, the difference between the the, the uh, Hagerstown uh, vendor and the Indiana uh, vendor is is uh, about one percent. Just a note. Well, yeah, we've been. I know we don't. I know we don't yeah. have that. I yeah. know that's always I mean, where do we a slippery uh, yeah. conversational yeah. slope, but well, on this one too, just a reminder: these are joint purchases with right. the county. Right, that's what I said. So, this is more of a county. Mm -hmm. That's what I said. This is more of a county's decision to. When were these? Um, I mean, I would imagine that we get a dis slight discount on bulk purchase of these kinds of things, but. I was down in Virginia this past weekend, and gas is going for two fifty-seven a gallon down there. And I'm wondering if we're paying too much, maybe because of the recent drop in gas prices. I don't know if if that's a, anything that we. This will not be considered. What they do is when they bid on that, they choose a date in um, I forget I have it written on there like in September from Opus, which is the oil price index, and they base it on that bid. Okay. The price can go up and down from that point. It'll fluctuate through the year. Okay. So it won't be that exact price. It's price not we, that price right now. The price now. we pay will fluctuate. That's correct. Okay. Depending on OPEC. They, they check that every mm. every week I get a new index of information okay. from the county. All right. That's good to know. And depending on when we purchase the fuel, if we purchase this week, then it's based on that price. I see. And so on. So you're not locking so, yourself in. No, it's, it's like not locked in. It's just they have to bid on a certain... They can't bid on a certain date because it fluctuates. So okay, much. Mm -hmm. thank so you. So they for base that. it on a, a set date in the past and say, "Here's what it was in this date." What they're really bidding on is their overhead. That's what they're gotcha. really bidding on. Gotcha. In September mm -hmm. 25th, we're right. been paying two mm -hmm. seven. Right. right, and gotcha. from there it can drop or gotcha. go up either way. And it uses so. that index, so it uses not arguable. that index. That's correct. You can look it up. Yeah, I or probably county. can. The county does. The county tracks the county. it for us. Yeah. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But the county bids it out for themselves, for us, and the Board of Education to get a, right. a better rate. Sure. Exactly. Thank right. you for that's that clarity. we've talked about. Yep. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Item M is wastewater chemical purchase, water and wastewater. Any questions about those? Moving right along, item N is the approval of the RFQ for a developer partner for the office development and recruitment. Any questions on those? I believe the feedback that we got was incorporated into this latest version. Yeah, this is what you, you reviewed on November 4th. Kathy and Jill have made some amendments summarized in the memo. If you're okay with it, we'd approve it next week and then start advertising for the RFQ. All right. Thank you for that review of the agenda for next week. We're a little bit ahead of schedule, which is always nice. But we do have our CBiz people here with us, so we're good we're good for the next item, which is the plan review with CBiz. I apologize. I've been losing my voice all day. Of course, today we're talking about health care, so I'm hoping it holds up at least for the next half hour or so. Thank you. Um, but I'm joined uh, by Becky Royal. Becky's a senior employee benefit consultant with CBiz. Hi, Becky. And we're Hi. here this afternoon to provide mayor and council just an update. There's no formal action required at this point. Um, but before I hand things over, I do just want to take a minute and cover some a little bit of background information. Um, CBiz has been the insurance, uh, ben or actually the benefits consultant for the city since 2007. And Becky works very closely with Susan DeLauder, as most of you are aware, is the HR administrator. She's our benefits guru. She's back in the second row. Um, they work extensively um, to make sure everything goes smoothly for everyone involved. 
Um, and I, I do just want to recognize Susan for getting us through the transition uh, to United Healthcare. Not an easy feat. Um, so the city's health plans are self-insured, meaning that the city pays the claims as they're incurred. Uh, CBIS works with staff to develop projections. We also look at performance as well as anything coming down the pipe as far as legal compliance or regulation changes. And health coverage is a major component of an employee's overall compensation package. Um, the city's health plan rates and the actual the plan designs are largely determined by existing union contract language. Um, so the city, as a fact, has absorbed a lot of the uh, premium increases and expenses over the past several years. So I also, in the packet, list um, the members of the health care committee. Committee members meet and talk about plan performance. They talk about uh, regulation changes. They also, uh, currently due to union contract language, have authority to vote on changes as far as rates and plan design uh, before it gets to mayor and council for approval. Um, so that's probably enough background. So I'll hand it over to Becky and she can cover the uh, memo. The I, I, memo. I have a question about the functioning of the committee. Mm -hmm. um, is it subject to majority vote? Is it if the committee votes it down, does it not come to the mayor and council or does it come to the mayor and council with a recommendation the committee feels we shouldn't do this? The current language in the contracts, it's three of the five employee groups have to vote to recommend something. So if they, if, if it gets voted down, then at that point it would not come to mayor and council for action. Three of the five employee groups. Right. So that's why on the, um, the listing of the members, you can see who are the voting members and who are the non-voting well, members. How is that determined? Is the, do the employee groups always vote in unison? Or there's two reps from There's all two but reps. One. They have one, one vote. They have one vote. Right. So usually the two will decide after talking to their members which way they're going to go on a certain issue. But three out of five have to recommend something before. Is that... Paul, is that in the contracts? Yes. Okay. And then it's been in there for several contract cycles. Right, but I just wanted, thought we ought to clarify that. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Are there any questions? Go ahead. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm going to go over the uh, few pages that are in this deck. Uh, again, as Karen said, it's, we're going to start with just an overview of how the self-funded plans are, are running. Uh, talk about some of the Affordable Care Act requirements that are coming up, uh, and then kind of look back at some of the changes that were made this past July 1st, and then finish up with talking about some of the things that are the committee's considering for the next year and the proposed action items for 2015. So on the health plan overview, um, just to, to reiterate that medical, pharmacy, and dental benefits are self-funded. Um, the plan does have specific stop loss that would protect it, so that's insurance on any individual catastrophic claimant, and that limit is set at $225,000 a year. And in the chart there, you can see the total cost for the medical, pharmacy, and dental plans for the two most recent plan years. So the plan years that started July 1, 2012, and the plan years that started July 1, 2013. And you can see that the 2013 plan year compared to the year before it uh, was kind of an unusual result in that you had a, um, an, a decrease in the um, cost compared to the prior year. Um, the health plan trend, as we'll see, um, is the, on average nationally is, is rising 6 to 8% a year. So to see even a flat or a decrease is a very good result. Becky, since we don't have screens, can you just mention briefly the dollar amounts? So people watching understand the, the yes. scale of uh, the program you're talking about. Sure. So the medical pharmacy cost for the plan year that started July 1, 2013 was $5.58 million, and that compares to the prior year, which was almost $5.8 million. On the dental plan, the July 1, 2013 plan year was $369,000. And that compares to a prior period of 375000 So these are also gross costs. So they include um, employee contributions and retiree contributions to the plan as well. Okay, what do you attribute the decrease to? 
Uh, mostly it's because the, in the last plan year, you kind of had a very fortunate year when it came to catastrophic claimants. You didn't have any catastrophic claimants, so no one hit that specific stop loss level. Some good workplace safety programs and... Yeah, so, th so that helps and wellness helps and then some of it is just, just luck. So when, when you see fluctuations, it's generally because there's been a, a catastrophic type of a situation. Um, that, that really impacts the results. But certainly any kind of wellness or safety um, that's going on here will help the plan overall. Thanks. Um, this year, it's you know we're only four months into the year, so we don't have a lot of results, but so far the plan for the first four months is running below the budgeted projection. I, I presume that the, the net cost to the city would be an available number. Yes. Is yeah. that something you'd all like to see? Yeah, I'd like to see it. Okay. I'd like to hear it. Okay. And the change, you know. Right, for both periods, yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, the next page um, talks about some of the Affordable Care Act um, requirements that are coming up. A lot of the um, requirements from this law have been phased in since it was passed in 2010 and 2014 was kind of a banner year but there are still some things that will be phased in over the next few years including in 2015 is what you've probably heard about are the pay or play penalties so that an employer either provides uh, health benefits or they pay a fine. Um, the Affordable Care Act um, does change the definition of what's considered a full-time employee when it comes to health insurance benefits. So it's requiring employers to provide benefits for anyone who works 30 hours or more, more per week on average. So that will be a change for the city. And, and just to jump in, at this point we have about 16 individuals who will qualify currently for that. Who currently are not receiving benefits, who will under this? Correct, who will become eligible under this provision. Mm -hmm. 16 out of 400 some. Yeah, I don't have that exact number out of all the part time. And that's across all funds. Hard to all right. part That's, that's time. across all funds. Correct. That's, mm -hmm. just check. Okay. Thank you. Right, but we don't know how many of them will actually enroll. So yeah. presumably they may have health coverage somewhere else. Right. Mm. Okay. Uh, the next two items are some fees that are um, required. The first one is the transitional reinsurance fee, and this is a fee that's required by all health plans, whether fully insured or self-insured, and it supports the cost of the um, federal and state exchange, public exchange plans, because the um, belief is that those plans are going to be overrepresented by people of high risk, so all other plans have to kind of share in those costs to help cover that um, for, for a three-year period. Let, so, Let me see if I understand this. We in the city of Hagerstown provide our employees with a pretty good health care plan. Yes. And as a result of that, as a consequence of that, we have to pay a tax to subsidize the people who come on the exchange. That's correct. Of which open enrollment opened, uh, I think, three or four days ago. Yeah, the second. There was an open enrollment period last year. This is the second open enrollment period. Well, I'm, I'm hearing that the tax that's going, that, that's going to be paid could ultimately be a 40% tax on, on the best health care programs is that right so that's a different tax that's the it's a different tax. that's a different tax Platinum that's tax. that's the cat what's called a Cadillac tax it's the Cadillac. excise tax on high cost health plans and that comes in 2018 so is ours a Cadillac health plan um, potentially it is okay. um, so so that is something that we've been talking about in the benefit committee meetings that it's something that we need to keep our eye on it's based on your plans costs per employee compared to a threshold that will be identified by the federal government. Which we don't know yet. So there was a threshold identified in the 2010 legislation. Yeah. So when we compare you to that threshold, um, you are slightly at risk. If you go to the bottom um, bullet point on this page, your active employee plan um, looks like it might have a tax of about $20,000 compared to those thresholds that are in the 2010 legislation. 
there needs to be additional guidance released on this aspect of the law, and it could be that that threshold will change because it's benchmarked against the federal employee health plan. So depending on how that health plan has run compared to these 2010 benchmarks, we'll determine whether those benchmarks are raised or lowered. So unfortunately, there's not a whole lot to go on. So we can go on you know, based on what we know. So we want everyone covered, but if you cover people well, then we're gonna tax you more to cover everybody else. Exactly, yes. Right. In other words, they give you eight or nine options of plans to choose from, but they want you to choose one that's somewhere above the uh, cheap plans and somewhere below the expensive plans. Right. So the uh, the most generous plan that's available at an exchange is what they call a platinum plan, and that uh, has a value uh, actuarially of 90%, which means it covers in aggregate for a group of people, it would cover 90% of that group's cost. So. Um, when you compare employer health plans to that, most group health plans are probably about an 88% actuarial value, but some plans, like your plan, might be in the low 90% actuarial value, which is common um, in um, municipalities, it's common in unions. So unions are really fighting this aspect of the law, and you know we've you know had an election recently, so we don't really know what's going to happen with this, with this particular well, component. A However, lot of unions have fought to keep good health care plans in exchange for not getting salary right. increases or compensation. Right. Well, and, and or many, both. yeah, or both. And so many, many union plans are running against this limit because they tend to be richer than other non-union plans. So. Uh, it remains to be seen what happens with it. However, this was a key revenue generator for the legislation. So if, if the money doesn't come from this, it has to come from somewhere else. And this, as I understand, this also applies to retirees, which is basically what you're saying. Yes, yeah, so there'll be a different threshold for retirees. It will be higher. Um, there's also a different threshold for employees that are in high-risk professions like police and fire. So there is a possibility that your threshold would be increased a little bit so that we reduce the tax somewhat, depending on your proportion of police fire to the rest of the population. But I think what I'm hearing you say is this aspect is what's causing a lot of organizations, companies, and I'm sure some governments to uh, Send send their retirees off to uh, Medicare, uh, a lesser plan than I'm I'm sure the city of Hagerstown offers. Yeah, so there is a trend in benefits in general for, to um, to transition retiree health plans, especially away from the traditional way of the employer providing and sponsoring a plan to sending them to what's called a private exchange. So it's not necessarily, or it could be, but it's not necessarily usually through the state or federal government, but it's a private exchange which is usually run by uh, maybe a consulting firm or an insurance company. And so they'd say, you know, you can go there and you can buy from this array of Medicare supplement plans. And, you know, here's X dollars per year to help you um, with that. So that is a trend in retiree medical benefits. So the bottom line is, if we're going to continue providing what many people who have the health care that the city offers considers adequate health care, it's going to cost us a lot of money in, in the future to make that happen. Yeah, and so th this, this aspect it is very troubling for many employers, and it's something that we are looking at every year and always updating the projection to see how you're running against it and how it's going to impact you. But again, you know, the guidance could change. Many components of this law have been delayed. So uh, I, I don't really recommend a wait and see approach because I think you have to be prepared that it's going to happen. Um, and then if it is delayed, issues. then so much the better. I'm sorry, we're I, having a technology problem. Sure. <laughs> I think that one of wow. the answers to that question of whether you wait or don't wait, at least for me, is who is responsible for the um, difference. In other words, if we maintain mm -hmm. our plan and, and, and uh, at the end of the day we arrive at the point where the, the federal government says um, 
your plan's too rich. If you want to keep that, that's fine, but we're going to penalize you for, for mm -hmm. providing your employees uh, that plan. Um, the, the way that I look at this is the taxpayer uh, will be the entity that ends up paying both. In other words, if we maintain the same plan, but we're penalized for it, then they'll pay for both the plan we continue to maintain and the penalty for which we'll receive for maintaining it. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming in the law, uh, which, which I am probably, you know, uh, 500 other congressmen haven't read, is, <laughs> is, um, uh, is a provision that doesn't allow us to take that penalty and apply it against our plan cost provision? Um, so the penalty would be assessed to the city. Um, however, if you took that penalty and spread it among the employee contributions for that particular plan, there's nothing that would prevent you from doing that. So that is indeed what many employers are looking at doing if they... Except that it penalizes us for even having the plan. Then. Sort of a passive way to put everybody in the single type system. I mean, I mean reality, if, you're pushing them up from the bottom and you're pushing them down from the top. Mm -hmm. You push them into a category of that 88th percentile of plan type that, you know, is the average and makes sense. Right. So, so yeah, either employers are either reducing benefits so that they get both their costs below that threshold or looking at passing on any tax that might be imposed onto the employees who want to enroll in those richer plans. And at the base of that uh, idea, if you will, because I sort of view the, 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 the CARE Act as, as sort of this seesaw where you know, you're trying to get enough of the young one, you're trying to get mm -hmm. uh, it in a timing framework where uh, it covers the uninsured so you balance out the seesaw. And at the base of that is the federal government uh, ideas uh, of these penalties and things that will hold up that base long enough to stabilize that balance. Mm -hmm. that, that's how I can sort of see it in my mind. And this would be one of those components that if it doesn't occur, or if we make the corrective action in time that uh, destabilizes that base, and it's a timing issue. The, the other part of it is that the, the threshold that they're using will increase every year, but it increases just at the rate of general inflation when health, health plan inflation is you know, two to three times that rate. So you know, the thought is that eventually, whether it's in 2018 or 2022 or 2025, most plans will hit it. Because the factor won't remain static. Correct. It'll be a forcible well, provision. The, the, the increase in the threshold is less than the increase, increase in the cost. Right. So most plans will be creeping up towards well, your penalty the threshold. Will be, but your penalty won't be a static figure. It'll be a forcible provision over time. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> it would be a point at which you decide where that break even is, where it just isn't. Right. So at some point, even if you don't hit it in 2018, that's not just. You like might hit it in 2021. Exactly. You're, most plans will hit it at some point. Yeah. And, right. and it, again, it, this was a key revenue generator to pay for all of the things that come with the Affordable Care Act. So it, you know, if something happens to this component of it, you know, I'm not sure where they would find yeah. the money that they need to pay for everything else. Because right now, 20 grand doesn't seem. No. Big in the grand scheme of our right. of our healthcare budget process, mm -hmm. but that gets to be about a hundred thousand, and you really got to start thinking. Right. You know, this 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 isn't helping anybody. But, but but Karen, and be careful how you answer this. To make a change in who absorbs that cost would require a change in contracts. Is that true? That's correct. Yeah. So, you know, to change one of the contribution <laughs> ratio or other aspects of you know your, your copay things like that those all have to be negotiated right there, there's language in there that deals specifically about rates and um, that basically any change to rates how it affects net pay as right. well as um, so we're already we can't affect at the moment the the 60,000 the 42,000 and the to be determined for 2016 mm -hmm. and but this other threshold is 2018 Right. So we could make an assumption, you know, when we're talking about what we're going to have to deal with of some reasonable amount, and, and hopefully by the time we have to deal with this, which is about one and a half more years, 
we, we, we will need a good estimate mm -hmm. of, of what we're facing if we can do it. Mm -hmm. If not, we need a good basis for guesstimating that more than we have now. If we can. Which is why at the end of the day, you'd be, you'd be well off before 2018 hits to say, okay, let's say it's going to be 50 grand. I would be better off because the taxpayer is going to absorb both sides, the provision and the penalty, to say, I'm going to go to the employee groups and say, look, I'm going to split the difference here. Well, that's what I'm talking and, about. And do 25 of that, and I'm going to put 25 back in somehow that, that you don't, well, that's, you know, as the plan decreases, you get, you get that well, provision well, that's, made up. Yeah, well, that's different. what I was saying. We, we yeah. have to deal with that before the oh, yeah. 2016 cycle. Some of this we can't, you know, it's beyond negotiating now. That We need to have a handle on it. Yeah, I'd say deal with it proactively. Well, All right, well, but we well, know but, the Affordable is, Care Act is still But you moving. did point out, though, that this is going to be a very large agenda in the next Congress. Yeah. Yes, I think so. Yeah, because these problems are, I think, pretty well known. Yes. Uh, on it's, the other hand, Dawn, it's, I don't think it's 40, it's not 40 percent. I mean, you know, it's... It's 40 percent of the amount of um, your cost that's above the threshold. So okay. if, the, if the threshold is 10,000 and you're it's, at 10,500, it's 40 percent of the 500. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what it is this year. So there is a 40%. Yeah. So you're right. Yeah, so there is a 40%. I was, right. I was thinking 40%, Mike. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. not 40% yeah. of the total. Of right. above the, the threshold. unknown threshold. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Clear as mud. Yep. Yeah. Did you want to go back up to the What oh, we'll need is a good idea monetarily of what we're facing and because we'll need it to, to negotiate, quite frankly. Right. We just can't pick up everything, and it's a very good plan. Yeah. All right, so the, the fees that are in the middle of the page, those aren't related to that high cost plan. Those are some these fixed fees that are of a short term duration. So the transitional reinsurance fee, again, that's just a three year period, and it will decline each year. And then the patient centered outcomes research fee, that's a, a pretty nominal fee. It will have incremental increases each year until 2019, and then that fee sunsets. And, you and can you explain what that's for? Um, that funds research um, to study how different uh, types of patients would um, react to different types of treatment. So it's to, to base you know, protocols um, that are more patient-centered, how people might react differently based on gender, race, ethnicity, that sort of thing. I know they're doing a lot now too with like care concierges where to prevent people coming back to the hospital, you know, they have people who will call the folks in their home and check on making sure they're doing their medicine or following up on other aspects of their treatment to prevent them from having to come in and use yeah. more health care services. So that's pretty common with a lot of health plans and so United Healthcare, who the city just changed to, has has that um, component to it. So they have nurse coaches that will reach out to people who um, have chronic conditions or being released from the hospital and that sort of thing to try to make sure that they're compliant with their doctor's instructions, that they understand the instructions, that they're, you know, filling their prescription and taking everything. So, so that is a component of the services that you have now in your plan. But doesn't it also boil down at times to what course of treatment the provider and or the Affordable Health Care Act may approve for a given illness? Help well, determine that. But the Affordable Care Act isn't determining what's okay. You know what's going to be approved under your plan. Okay. So under what's your plan, the the plan document is what's going to determine what's going to be covered and how it's going to be covered. And so when um, the city switched from the Care First Administrators to United Healthcare, we kind of went very painstakingly through what Care First covered to make sure that we were mirroring it. Um, so that we that you know there was you know kind of a no loss no gain, um, and that's what that's the document that determines what things are going to be covered and how they'll be covered under your plan. Okay. Um, the last item, the second one from the bottom on this page, um, just want to talk about this is reporting to the IRS that will be for calendar year t starting calendar year 2015. It'll be due first quarter of 2016. And this is a pretty extensive, detailed report that all employers will have to provide that lists all of their employees, all their employees' dependents, who's, who's eligible coverage, who's been offered coverage, who accepted coverage. 
Um, and then you'll have to provide similar documentation to each participant, sort of like a W-2 for health coverage, so that that employee can then prove when they need to satisfy that they've um, complied with the individual mandate to have health insurance, that they have something uh, that proves that they had acceptable coverage. All right, the next page talks about some of the changes that went into effect on July 1, 2014. So as we've already mentioned, the medical pharmacy vendor changed to United Healthcare. We talked a little bit about how we worked to mirror the United Healthcare plan to what was in place with Care First. There were um, some changes um, that were, at least the first one was required by the Affordable Care Act, and that is that the out-of-pocket maximum that's um, in place on the medical plan has to include medical and pharmacy. In the past, it only included medical, so pharmacy was sort of uncapped. It didn't have an out-of-pocket maximum. So now um, a participant is protected if they have very high costs that there is a single out-of-pocket maximum that they'd have to reach in a year. And so while we were um, making that change, we also took the opportunity to make some other changes to the pharmacy benefit because there was a feature in the prior pharmacy benefit that was pretty unpopular with people who took very expensive drugs. And that was that once you reach a certain cost threshold, you had to pay 50% of the cost of the drugs, which for some medications can be uh, very expensive. So we were able to kind of actuarially work to change some of the co-pays and this combined out-of-pocket maximum to come up with a comparable benefit that just means flat co-pays regardless of where you are in the dollar threshold of, of taking your prescriptions. Um, we also lowered the PLUS plan deductible, so that's that high deductible plan. Um, that's another option um, to the level plan for active employees. So we, we lowered that deductible to make that more attractive to employees to see if, if more employees would want to join that plan. And then with the United Healthcare, just came some enhanced services, like they have a 24-7 nurse line that people can call if they want to get some uh, medical advice in the middle of the night or on the weekend. Um, they have some enhanced wellness services and other online services that employees can use, including a health cost calculator. So if somebody wants to go in there and model and see what something costs, they can do that before they obtain a service. Also, uh, in mm -hmm. uh, Karen, I, I'm not on the plan, so I, maybe I don't get it all. Are, are the employees uh, being informed of these these services, the nurse line, we're paying for them, right? And the employees, is there a good marketing program so our employees know they can do this? When we transition, we did send out information. We do hmm. send out periodic reminders as well. Yeah. Um, we specifically wanted to kind of bring up the online cost calculator because it's very interesting if you go in and look at it, how much um, a certain service costs mm -hmm. practice per practice can be very significant. Um, so hopefully we're creating more consumer driven uh, shoppers or users of the health insurance plan so they can see the impact of their use. Well, but all three are services that are offered, so we might right. as well. And I, I just think it's people miss it the first time. They're used to the old way, and, right. and it's something we have you to need to keep reminding people that these are available since we're, it's part of our policy. Absolutely. Um, also, employee and retiree contributions for the um, coverages were maintained, so they saw no change to those rates. And then uh, the last item is that there was also a change in the vendor for the flexible spending account, health reimbursement account, and COBRA administration. Those services changed to discovery. And we've gotten very good feedback from that change. Um, Page five has some of the areas that the Benefits Committee is looking at for this year. Um, the first one is what's required by the Affordable Care Act is expanding the coverage requirement on the health plan to 30 plus hours per week. So it is required on the health plan. As Karen mentioned, 16 employees will become eligible that aren't currently eligible. And then the decision for the city to make is whether or not this change in eligibility, whether that should apply to other benefits as well or only where it has to. Um, so then the second item, again, health plan costs, it's just something you have to keep your eye on that the national trend is increasing six to eight percent. Um, then the 2018 excise tax is looming. We will do our projection against your cost against that tax threshold every year when we do our projections. Your level plan design remains very rich, so that's the plan that we're most concerned about reaching that um, excise tax 
limit. And you've also had no change to employee contribution rates since 2010. So that means all of the increases that the plans have incurred since 2010, the city has borne um, because employee costs have remained flat. Can you say that again? Much louder. <laughs> So since there's been no change in employee contributions since 2010, all the increases in the health plan costs have been borne by the city. Which again is one of those trade-offs when the city was in tight financial times and right. working with the employee groups to determine the contracts. That was one of the things the city was able to do and did do, which was to maintain those contribution rates. Right. Uh, the last item on this page is some of the things that we're looking at to see whether there's any savings or enhancements that are available from some of the ancillary coverages um, through a marketing on the life and long-term disability and the vision plans. So some of those plans are paid for entirely by employees, but we do want to see whether there's any um, savings or enhancements that we can um, obtain for them. So just on the last page is a timeline of some of the things that we're working on. Um, a vision request for proposal, as well as a life and long-term disability request for proposal. Those are underway now. And um, we'll be meeting with the Benefits Committee in January to review the results of that. And then we will seek mayor and council approval on any vendor changes if it looks like um, a vendor change is recommended. How are those being put out? Are they, uh assuming the current level of benefits or asking for a package that amounts to a certain amount what is in the rfp that might improve uh, the cost well so at a minimum they'd have to duplicate the the benefits that are available now um, so okay. they might have though either enhanced services or lower rates or a multi-year rate guarantee so any of those things would make it attractive but but fundamentally you're doing apples to apples as far as the services yes. go, or the coverages go. Yes, at a, at a bare minimum, they have to meet what's already being provided. Okay. <coughs> Any questions or other feedback? Thank you very much for that presentation, for indulging all of our questions. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is the draft city debt management policy. The last debt policy was approved in 1987. Oh yeah, why don't we do that since we have our guests here from the Fine Arts Museum Board. <laughs> they could wait. Hey. You want to hear about debt management, right? Yes. <laughs> I understand you guys would like to present something to the city. Please come on up. We'll introduce you. This is Rebecca Massey Lane, the museum director. How do you do? Good, Good thank you. you. John Schnebley on the board of the Museum of Fine Arts. And do you have other folks here you'd like to introduce? Conrad? Yes. yes. That's okay. Ms. Bullington? And Ms. Smith. Please come on up. Oh, nice. Wonderful. Great. Yeah, so we're ready to celebrate the... Do you want to give him the microphone? You know, we're doing this on air and oh, okay. live well, we got on a, TV. Yes, here. we got a yeah. spiff up here then. Okay, do it by the book. Thank you. We're here to, uh, well, uh, for a couple recognitions here in, in honor of the, um, the 275th anniversary of the Hager House, which, uh, gee, that was a long time ago when Jonathan Hager came out here into the emptiness of Western Maryland and built a beautiful uh, stone farmhouse, farmstead. So um, our first um, presentation really is to the city of Hagerstown. And I wanted to thank the city of Hagerstown for its steadfast support of, uh, I think, the historical and cultural communities here. I know uh, we've had tough budget times the last few years, but uh, we really want to thank the council for uh, 
uh, the thoughtful uh, budgeting process which has supported these things. I think it's very important to the community that we do this. I think uh, heritage and tradition are important when we move forward to try to uh, assure our mutual prosperity in the future. So, uh, First resolution is for the city and we'll read that one. Whereas the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts has enjoyed a long and fruitful relationship with the Jonathan Hager House and the city of Hagerstown, Whereas the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts and the Jonathan Hager House share a commitment to public education, historical understanding, and cultural enrichment. Whereas the Jonathan Hager House and the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts enjoy collaborations on many public events and other art activities in the city park uh, uh, environs. Whereas the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts anticipates many more years of sharing city park, the city park neighborhood and enjoyable partnerships with the Jonathan Hager House. Now, therefore, the members of the Board of Trustees of the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts does express its appreciation for an authentic partnership with the Jonathan Hager House and the city of Hagerstown and congratulates the Jonathan Hager House for attaining their 275th anniversary year. Signed by Rebecca Massey Lane, Director, and John Schnebley, President of the Board of Trustees. Thank you. Thank you. So. Thank you, Emily, and ladies from the store. Thank you all very much. And then, uh, for the, the same words. <laughs> yes. this is this is ditto. Okay, ditto. ditto. Okay, but we'll read we'll read it anyway for to read it into the record as they say. Whereas the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts has enjoyed a long and fruitful relationship with the Jonathan Hager House in the city of Hagerstown, whereas the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts and the Jonathan Hager House share a commitment to public education, historical understanding, and cultural enrichment, whereas the Jonathan Hager House and the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts enjoy collaborations on many public events and other activities in the city park, park <coughs> environs, whereas the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts anticipates many more years of sharing the city park neighborhood and enjoyable partnerships with the Jonathan Hager House. Now, therefore, the members of the Board of Trustees of the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts does express its appreciation for an authentic partnership with the Jonathan Hager House in the city of Hagerstown and congratulates the Jonathan Hager House for attaining their 275th anniversary year. So that's a copy for the Hager House and the Historical Society. And I also want to make special recognition of the Historical Society. They do a wonderful job with volunteers of maintaining the artifacts of our community. Uh, we share some of those activities at the museum uh, in doing that kind of thing for the community. But uh, a lot of volunteer hours up there at the Miller House, and we appreciate everything that uh, they do. Well, I want to thank you, Mr. Schnebley, for your prior service as a city councilman to the city of Hagerstown. <laughs> I'm sure you understand what it's like to sit around this table and make some of these tough decisions. And also, of course, to the Museum of Fine Arts. It's such a, a great institution we have, and it is quite a historical uh, partnership. And uh, also with the Washington County Historical Society, uh, many partnerships, like you say, that work in collaboration to highlight the great things about our community. So. Thank you for this special recognition and for the, especially the folks that are there taking care of the Hager House every day and throughout all the seasons and uh, looking forward to many great things to come. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you, you bet. The rest of Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> um, Miss Aaron always wants a photo, so okay. <laughs> come gather round. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you again. Okay. Keep up the good work. Thank you for that. Now we'll talk about the debt management policy. And as I was saying, the, the last debt policy was approved in 1987. 1987. That might have been when, that might have been when Mr. Schnebley was still on the council. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. you're right. 
So the reason that we are here is just pretty much to take a beginning look at um, a document that we have drafted, a preliminary document, so that we have an opportunity to review it and then um, come back and possibly revisit during another work session in December with the goal of having this approved by December 16th. Again, one of the things, this, the debt policy is um, very instrumental to strong financial management and with the last update being so long ago, I think everybody can kind of see the need for revisiting it and trying to get it current into where we want it to be today and in the future. So do you want to kind of hit the highlights of it? Sure. So first for the debt policy, just the overall purpose. I think the overall purpose basically for the debt management policy is to provide that sound financial management practices to help protect and enhance the city's bond rating. Um, the policy provides guidelines for mayor and council as well as city staff and this helps us to issue long-term debt in a manner that is affordable to our community and that's a very important factor that we wanted to make sure was within this document because it is something that we do take into consideration before we issue debt. Um, we mentioned in here that we work the city city staff doesn't just issue debt we get per approval through resolution and ordinance from mayor and council but in addition to that we also work with an independent bond council and an independent financial advisor before each and every single bond issue aside from the purpose the main provisions of this of this policy um, we pretty much have them numbered but i think primary is first and foremost the city shall maintain adequate operating cash to meet future debt service requirements. This simply means that once we look at issuing a bond, we are not going to actually issue a bond if within our checkbook, we do not have the financial means to pay those bondholders and loan payments into the future. Um, I'm gonna skip a couple. The city will limit its long-term borrowing to capital items and projects that cannot be funded from current revenues. That's where we need we need to have a, I believe we need to have a, a correction. I, I think um, any project could be funded from current revenue, so you can't really use that definition because you could use cash to, to fund anything. So really, I think it should be the city will limit its long-term borrowing to capital items and projects that can be defined as eligible for bond financing. Or words to that effect and take out the that cannot be funded from current revenues that's to me sort of a non sequitur since everything can be funded by current revenue so is a draft and a working draft that's at least language to look at okay and I think Michelle, just explain what you are trying to say, or we were trying to say, is that, that <clears throat> and it ties back to the pay go. It they're, does. They're, they're linked. So maybe work your way through the policy, and then uh, council members got a good suggestion there, but yes. just to cover it. Right. I think you're saying if we've uh, uh, put forth a certain amount for pay go, um, then you know borrowing is for the rest that are eligible but i don't i don't think the language works for that that's okay all. yeah we're just trying to say let's not borrow if we've got current revenue to cover the debt or cover the item why would we borrow well but that's a big if uh, to, to me it ought to be uh you can do that and you can cover that in another definition down below yes yeah, so i think five and eight are linked so and what we what we're really trying to ensure is that within this document we allow flexibility so that for capital items and projects that we as a body and as as an organization sit back and calculate and take into consideration multiple factors before the decision is whether we're going to use PAYGO operating money or if we're going to right. use bond issues as right but I think source. number eight with, and I have a change in number eight too so so I made a note and we'll look at it the next. Um, the city will not use long-term debt to fund annual operating costs. And I think this is a very important um, thing to mention and actually one that um, 
bond council and the IRS and several other guidelines and regulations really frown upon something that the rating agencies look at. Next, capital projects financed through the issuance of bonds shall not be financed for longer than the average expected useful life of the bond. So basically, if we have a 20-year bond, but we're looking to finance 10 projects, and all of those projects only have a useful life of 10 years, we are not going to finance it for 20. We're going to have to find a way to either finance it for 10 or find another funding source. And then next, and, and Council Member Brubaker, this is the one you were mentioning just a minute ago. When available current operating revenue, in other words, pay as you go or pay go, may be used to fund capital items and projects that otherwise would be financed through long-term borrowing. And the, the only thing I would add, that's fine, I would say, or do not qualify for bond financing. An or. Because sometimes you put systems of things in the capital program because you do them year after year or over a period of years, or they're combined with things that are eligible for bond financing. So uh, you have things in your capital program that aren't strictly eligible for bond financing. So PAYGO can be used to either offset bond financing or to pay for things that don't qualify for bond financing. So. I would, I would add that. And so then I think you're covered between number five and number eight. At least that, you know, uh, we can talk about it some more if you know, but that's. Do you understand that, Michelle, or? I do. So I, 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 I think with the wording, I think the message is the same. I think we're, I think our end goal is the same. That within this document, right. we're allowing ourselves the flexibility as, a, as an organization and as a, as a, as a group to take into consideration and look at the individual projects right. and items to determine right. if we're going to do pay go or right. Bond financing. Right. And again, I, upon the I, I would and, say and other items. Right. And, and, and as far as if we have money available for pay go, well, that's a big if because uh, who knows if you do or not, you could argue you should have a certain amount of your capital or, or your general fund and not spend it on this and put it into PAYGO. On the other hand, you may have to. So I, 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 you know, saying that that's a first call is, is pretty tough. So I think between the two, it gives us enough flexibility. And I think what Michelle and I are trying to clarify over the past couple of years, there's been some vehicle purchases we funded with bond issues that we would rather have paid for right. out of our annual operating revenues. Right. They weren't, they weren't strong enough to do that. We don't want to keep moving in that direction of loading up right. borrowed debt on purchases that we should be paying for out or, of or, or, And I added a phrase, or do not qualify for bond financing. Yeah. Uh, how about may not, may not qualify. May is a better we, word. We, we need flexibility, we, and that's right. what we Well, but may. that's why I had that phrase, or yeah. may not qualify. But as an organization, I think what we're trying to say is let's, let's be cautious on that in terms of putting right. items into the bond issues that, uh, and borrow money to pay for them. And, and we just said they need to qualify. That was the wording we added. They need to qualify for, for bond finance. Okay. All right. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over a couple of the items listed here, not because they're not important, but because I think really with this policy, some of the key things are the measurements and the calculations and the ongoing monitoring. Basically, how we're evaluating and some of the limits that we're internally looking at. So I'm going to skip ahead to item number 12, and that's the city's future funding obligations for OPEB and pensions shall also be considered as long-term debt. And I think, again, as an organization, the bond rating agencies have already recognized this. Standard & Poor's mentioned it when they gave us our upgrade back in June of 2014. Um, GASB has come on board and starting with this next fiscal year, we are going to be looking at not just putting a footnote disclosure on our pension, our outstanding pen unfunded pension liability in our CAFR and our audited financials, but we're also going to have to add that right into our liability section. So I, I've, I've talked to Michelle about doing a bond capacity chart that would show, well, here's what we could do here under our bond policy. Here's what the amount of money that we could do. 
here's the fiscal impact on the operating budget. So what you're saying, and I'm not arguing with it, is we would have to find a way to add these, subtract these in, in that bond capacity calculation rather than be a footnote. Correct. That when we, when we You need to have a line that said OPEB or pension obligations or something like that. Yes. Yes. I think, I think mm -hmm. it's, it's financially responsible. I think, again, the rating agencies are already doing that math and have been doing it. Right. We have included all the language and have been including those liabilities in our um, audited financial. So they've actually been recalculating and adjusting. And probably one of the areas that we discussed that we would look at is when you look at the city's total debt, again, total debt, long-term debt to include these items, we could look at it from the standpoint of comparison to percentage of our total assessed value as a city. Mm -hmm. And make sure that the city's assessed value and our base, our community, is strong enough to support our total debt and total future 17. obligations. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah, it's yeah. number 17 on the list. But again, we want to acknowledge it within our policy because it's, it's here, it's right. going to be right. putting it in all of our other documents. Um, neither Maryland state law nor the city charter mandate, mandates a limit on municipal debt. So we're just recognizing that the state doesn't place a limit on us, our charter doesn't place a limit on us, but within the body of this policy, we're putting limits in place so that we do not just spend. The city will maintain an average maturity of total city general obligation bonds at or below 25 years. And this item specifically we have adjusted and changed. This does not mean that we cannot do a bond issue for 30 years. Does not mean we cannot do a bond issue for 25. But when we look at total loans, total bonds, and total debt, so our regular geo bond issues plus looking at those water quality ones that we do through MDE. At any point in time, we look at total debt that we have outstanding and how many years we have to pay. And we want that to be under 25 years. And actually at this point, we're, we're, we're below 20. Right. But if we don't look at increasing this, um, again, 25 is a good number. It's, it's not 30, it's not longer. Um, it gives us flexibility, so if we're at the point where we have a number of large potential projects that are looking um, feasible and we wish to do bond issues, we're not restricting ourselves in that we can't if financially, otherwise it's potential. Again, that's part of bond capacity calculations. Correct. If we set a 25, that's a number you can crank in. Doesn't mean you have to go to that, but you can crank it in there. And it's an average, correct. Next, total, total tax-supported annual debt service requirements or expenditures. How much we're paying back every year for principal and interest payments. For general long-term debt will not exceed 10% of general fund operating revenues. Actually, this, this item, just, just to note, is not new. It's something that we actually include. There's a chart within the budget book. Um, there's a couple charts within our CAFR. It's something that we have always looked at. But again, just important that we're putting these limits here and we're continuing to monitoring them. The city will maintain its general funds tax supported debt at a level not to exceed 1,000 per capita. And what we're defining here in this item, again, um, general fund tax supported debt. So this $1,000 debt per capita item is looking at on our general fund side. And the reason that we felt it necessary to separate this out is because when you look at our population of city residents and you're looking at our debt, the residents support our general fund through tax revenue. However, with our utility group, water and wastewater, there's a large number of customers that we have that are outside our city limits. So using the city resident population on that debt, again, it's a good measure, but I don't know that we want to limit that to $1,000. And if you look at some of our charts, again, our CAFR, you will see historically when you look at total debt for the city just to city residents, it's a little higher than that thousand. If you look at general fund, we're significantly below that level and have been. 
And, and that's always a trick and so, or a, something you have to really think out in these is what is supported with general fund tax revenues, what's supported with fees, and has a general, the backing of general obligation bonds, which is sort of overlapping. And then if we have any, what's supported strictly only with revenues, which is the most expensive way to go, but there might be times you want to do that. So just, just a comment that it's something you have to watch. And we, we may have to refine that at some point to, be, you know, what, where we are, exactly who's paying that. That is a $40 million number, right, roughly? Actually, currently, the, the general fund supported is $15 million. The business supported or enterprise is 51 Correct. So right. in total, our debt just for bond issues is $66 million. 66. Just to give you a frame of reference, and this is in the budget, five years ago, the general supported was $20 million, almost $20 million five. So it's gone down. Uh, over five million. The uh, enterprise debt was 41 million. So five years ago we were at 62 million. Ten years ago we were at 11.6 on the general supported, 19 on the enterprise. Our total debt ten years ago was 31 million. So our total debt has risen substantially in the last ten years because of issues that we've we've provided for upgrading our enterprise operations, our, our utilities. Well, Mostly we pay for major sewage and water upgrades. Is, Correct. Is Collection the, system, system rehab. Well, um, one that's currently ongoing is, of course, the thir approximately $13 million R.C. Wilson plant improvement upgrades. That actually is included in the, the new over tanks. $6 million is included in oh. our $66 million The wastewater treatment plant. Well, the the, the, the wastewater treatment we brought to Chesapeake Bay standards. And those, those are funded through the service charges of the utility right. customers who are both city uh, property owners as well as people outside of the city. I, I think what's important to recognize, though, is that the, gen the tax supported debt has gone down. It's gone down from it's, five years ago. It's gone yeah. up from ten years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Because the amount that we're that we've been issuing in recent years yes. is is less than the amount well, that we have been paying off the, to all of our older debts. For, for five years, five years now, we've had a fiscal crisis, and right. also development has really stopped. And those are both things that you do need some bond debt to. Uh, well, one restricts the bond debt. And the other is something that you tend to issue bonds to support. And, you know, so on, under both those circumstances, what we issue has gone down. But, Michelle, but to, to do some of the things we're planning to do, and given our budget constraints, we may have to issue more. Right. And, Michelle, and I need to clarify for the full $66 million that we owe now, even though $51 million of that is tied to utilities, when we issued that debt, we, we pledged the full faith and credit of our taxpayers for the full $66 million. Which yes. keeps the rates down. Keeps the rates but down. But that would, that would require a collapse of the utility system, if you know, the ability to pay, in order for that to in, in impact the taxpayers. And that's all incorporated into the five-year rate right. schedule. So the likelihood is not very great. That Merit Council uh, approved last year. So it's been it's been part of our financial plan all along, but just to so the, in the last the five years, Bruce, taxpayer debt has gone. Last five years, the, the, tax, the tax, the general fund portion has gone down five million. Yep. The down enterprise portion million. has gone up ten. Yep. And that's actually a schedule that we that we keep and we put in the budget book. It's in the front section right. in the um, budget message, because again, it's it's important. We assign a little section just to cover kind of our debt policy, our targets, and where we actually stand. Well, so, some of the enterprises based probably based on mandates from either the state or federal government, right? Right. Yeah. We didn't have any oh, choice. Right. Oh, yeah. Environmental regulations. Well, I, mean, I just wanted to point that out. Operating regulations. To our viewers. And, and that's the smart way to pay for it. If we had to pay for current revenue, rates would be out of sight. Oh, yeah. I, I agree with that. It's just that... Uh, and, and in those five years from 2005 to 10, when the general fund portion was increasing, we were doing pro projects such as the Eastern Boulevard widening that's been completed. 
the Jonathan Street utility upgrades and the streetscape there, those were both very sizable projects with substantial general fund debt there. Marty, the only point I was, whoops, he's gone. The only point I was trying to make was that somebody else is making our decisions for us, not those of us around the table. Well, and, 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 we, and the city handled them in the most prudent way yeah. possible. On the enterprise but, fund side, but yeah. Maybe we wouldn't have made the same decisions if, if we, we were making them. Could you summarize briefly what's different about this policy compared to the one approved in 1987? Is it more some of these uh, restrictions or creating some of these levels or? We actually had some restrictions in some levels. We literally had maybe six to eight little bullets. We didn't, we didn't have a purpose. We didn't say why we had it. We didn't say what our goals were. Um, so it's just to more we well define what it is. E yes. I think there's Perfect. some of these numbered items are new. Yes, they I are. I think the basic core is the same, but I think mm -hmm. we've, we've defined Expedia. it a little bit with sharper language mm -hmm. just to give more staff, clarity, right? Staff more clarity. Okay. And then we've added the section saying that we should be reviewed review it every, every five, five years. years sure. Because I think that's just, just real important. best practice. Yeah. Right. Yes. Um, the city will maintain all long-term debt at a level not to exceed 10% of the assessed valuation taxable property. And this is just tying back in earlier where we mentioned that OPEB and pension are total unfunded liabilities for those items are also long-term debt. So to kind of put this in perspective, Bruce has mentioned um, we ended June 30, 2014, our fiscal year 14. Bonded debt was 66 million. Um, as you'll see in another couple of weeks when we come back and do the presentation of the CAFR between OPEB and pension liability, we're adding about another 50 million. So total is 116 million. What, what's your time period for that number? For that number you just gave. For, for the 50, it's for the end of June 30, 2014, for the end of our well, uh, Okay, but that's an obligation over a period of time. Yes. Right. Just okay. like the 66 million. Right. Okay. Um, and again, within here, we're just mentioning just because we want to make sure that we have the flexibility. The city can issue GO bonded debt backed by the full faith and credit for enterprise funds. However, the debt is structured so that it will be paid by the revenue generated by those customers and those each applicable enterprise fund. Um, in the next section, we're just mentioning periodic reviews. Basically, um, once we issue the debt, we're not just letting it stagnant, but with our advice of our public advisor, there are times where it's um, beneficial to the city to refund or refinance any that's currently out there and outstanding. And we typically have those conversations on an annual basis right now. Uh, for the past several years, we really haven't had any benefit to doing any refunding of our existed debt. One of the most important parts of this whole entire thing is the very last statement is, is, as Bruce and the mayor just mentioned, but we feel that this is a very important policy and at a minimum every five years we need to bring it back and review it with this body just to make everybody aware. And that's not saying that if something doesn't change in the market or if mayor and council needs, if something arises that needs to be done before five years, we can certainly bring it back, but that we need to have that in a regular routine. That's a good idea. 27 years seems too much. A little too long. <laughs> and could you mention um, our new budget officer? Would you like to talk about that? Sure. Tell the council? Yes. We um, hired Christine Sneeringer. She is our new budget officer. She has over 15 years. She's extensive in budget budgeting, both as a, she, her career. She started as a senior accountant, um, a county manager and director of budgeting. Her last tenure for eight years was at Mount St. Mary's University, and for about eight to ten years before that, she was at Gettysburg College. So, primarily, all of her She's budgeting experiences is, is, is in education. <laughs> We're very happy that she is here. Um, now that the CAFR and the audit and a lot of that year end paperwork is, is finished, I'm trying to get around to introducing her to more people and actually. Rodney's the lucky person who gets to meet with us first, starting tomorrow. So, 
Um, Get them good. And I was <laughs> I was able to meet her this morning. <laughs> yes. She seems very nice. I'm yes. glad that we got that position filled and got you more help up there on the fourth floor. I'm very excited. Yes. So if it works, we can come back on December 2nd, run this by the mayor and council a second time at a work session. Gives you time to look through it. We can work with council member Brubaker and then uh, uh, right now, sounds like we, we should be okay by the 16th of December for adoption. Sounds like a plan. Michelle, you want to just give them two quick heads ups on what else is coming on the agenda. One, one is a bond issue. Just in general, you want to mention that we're, we're working on a, a future bond issue for the we next are. couple months. I'm so sorry. Probably be it's after been a the long first, day. It'll be after we, the first of the year, but. We are. We've been working and talking with Lester, who is our public um, financial advisor with Public Advisory Consultants, and with our bond council. So we're hoping to get that brought back um, soon <laughs> so that we can get that process started because we do need to have that funding and get those in place by the beginning of next year. Um, we actually had it in our budget book approved for fiscal year 14 for several different projects and items. It's in here for 2015 and what I'm looking at right now, it just makes more sense to combine that all into one issue, especially since fiscal year 14 is already finished. So just kind of reworking the listing of all the projects, trying to keep it to the, to the uh, bank qualified limit and we'll be bringing that back shortly. Uh, with an updated listing of the projects and again the projects have all for the most part been included in the budget in 14 and, and in 15. One, one of which is the trail that we're going to be talking about next <laughs> and then and then we'll have the auditors in in December with the uh, financial reports. With the CAFR presentation yes. Right now tentatively it's penciled in for December the 9th. Um, they're actually already anxious they, they just want to know what time to be here is pretty much what they had to say um, today. We have finished with the, the CAFR, um, the audit, UFR, all the, all the parts that um, combined make up our year-end processing. We had um, requested an extension until November 30th because there was a lot of changes that we were working through, especially with the language on the, un with the pension obligations and some of the GASBs that changed there. Everything is now off to the printers. So it will be posted on our website this, later this week and um, paper copies will be available shortly. We'll send out an email once they're here and in your boxes. Interest rates aren't going to stay down. And so a lot of people can discuss, can, can disagree over that, but it looks to me like they're not going to stay down. And so bringing back those bonds fairly quickly is probably to our long-term advantage. There's still a good bit of dis just unknown out there in oh, total in the home municipal bond market. Just different things that the federal government still has in place, some of the things that they're looking at doing, different legislation, and then just the overall nature of, of interest in the markets because it's been so low for so long. Well, I appreciate yours and Bruce's efforts on this, and thank you for engaging us with this that policy tonight. Thanks. Next up is the Urban Partners Catalyst Project Number Five: The Trail from City Center to City Park. Mr. Mayor, you mentioned during the preliminary agenda there was an issue that came up today um, that we'd like to have the council act on next week. Could Jim take three seconds here? Oh, okay, just sure. A little bit update on that. Sorry, I wasn't here earlier when you were talking about the preliminary agenda, but uh, in speaking with the mayor and Bruce today. Um, there is a fiber optic company that obtained a permit from us to install a fiber optic line in Wilson Boulevard and Frederick Street. And they were, have been working on this already, but um, a condition of issuing the permit, uh, similar as we've done with other fiber optic companies, the one that installed their facilities in Hagerstown, we said that there needed to be an agreement um, with the city that basically said, We'll let you install your line within the city right away, but in the future, if that fiber optic cable is in the way of something that the city wants to do, like installing a water line or a sewer line or a storm drain, that company has to relocate that line at their expense to allow the city to do their project. And we've done two or three of these in the past, and uh, what's before you is that agreement with CenturyLink, and we would just like permission or authorization to go ahead and execute that agreement for the city. 
Yeah. Any objections? Well, is this extending lines they already have, or is this a new provider? Um, what is the situation? Because I, you know, it's, it's an interesting group of streets there for fiber optic. It is. It's as far as I know, it's a new, it's a new provider in the city or a new entity. I don't think we've had CenturyLink here before. But CenturyLink and a previous one, uh, Level 3 Communications, they all are trying to get over onto Bowman Avenue. AT&T has a substation over there, and all of these fiber optic cables end up running through AT&T's substation over there on Bowman. So they all want to get to that point. So that's why this, this company is actually running from the Virginia Avenue overpass. Down with some so is it a forerunner to a future expansion, or I mean, I still don't quite get it. I mean, I don't see a nexus of customers here. Well, I think that it may it may be customers within the city. It may also be more of a regional growth, building a backbone so that they can serve more people in the in the region. Actually, it sounds like uh, ultimately it could be very much to our advantage for this to be done. It could be. I mean, I, I think it's like anything in telecommunications. The more the more providers, yeah. the more options that are available, it it probably puts the city in a. Have in a you talked position. to Scott Nice Warner about this? I have not. I know that he's aware of uh, some of these other companies establishing facilities in the city, but I did not talk to him specifically about because he's the done Centralin. overall reviews of fiber optic and what's going on. I mean, I have. I, I can't see anything wrong with it, but then again, there's so much going on that, w that we're not aware of. Well, and I, I would say too, there's a lot, there's probably a lot going on that um, we're not going to be aware of. I think the, the telecommunications well, company are pretty tight-lipped on their strategies. You're, you're looking for approval by the 25th? If, if possible. What, yes. yes, so could you talk to Scott sure. and let us know? You know, just to, that you've checked in and sure. how it fits with what else is going on. Absolutely. Thank okay, you. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. <clears throat> the um, trail project from the Arts and Entertainment District to City Park is something we've been talking about with the Urban Partners uh, study, and Jill and Kathy have been taking the lead on that, and they've kind of handed the baton to me uh, and our staff on, on this particular project now to, to try to make it a reality. So we have the surveys out in the field complete. Uh, we have about 20% of the work done. We had a public meeting on October 1st that was held in this room, and we, I think we had fantastic input and a lot of very interested people, uh, the best I've seen since I've worked here. Um, and the results of that public meeting were kind of the genesis of the packet that you have in your hands that May and Reichel put together for us. They took the input that night and uh, came up with um, ideas, basically, at this point, of what we could do along this trail, along this corridor. So I'd like to go through the May and Reichel's packet tonight, and I'd like to hear your input on the alignment. I'd like to hear your input on the scope that we're using for what we're calling phase one, any issues on the budget, uh, the schedule, and then if you had any input on the name of the trail, that would be great, but um, um, that's kind of a lower priority. So let me just walk us through, and please stop me wherever you'd like. The first drawing in the packet is the trail that we've been kind of working with, and it starts uh, down at uh, Park Circle on the left-hand side. It comes across Memorial Boulevard to Summit, where the um, bike trail was that we built uh, a few years ago. Then the proposal was to go up uh, Summit a little bit, turn right on Sycamore, then go up Hood Street, turn right on Lee, past Ellsworth Electric through their private property, through the Hagerstown Housing Authority's private property, quasi-public property, through the land of the Herald Mail where there's a potential for a park, which is right out in front of the county office building, up along the Herald Mail's uh, eastern perimeter to Antietam Street, and then we talked about how do we connect from Antietam Street over at the Antietam Paper Building 
to the heart of the A and E district. Is that uh, do we go take uh, Antietam Street over to Potomac? Do we go up the alley past the Plum? How do we do that? And we've wrestled with that a lot. Our proposal that we're what we're thinking about, and we'd love to hear what you have to say, is basically we're looking at this as the destination on either end being the city park, obviously, at the one end, and the Fine Arts Museum, and the destination at the other end being the A&E District, possibly the farmer's market. And how we would do that is uh, the alignment that we're suggesting now, the only change from what I just told you about, was when you come out of Park Circle and you follow the existing trail, we're suggesting we get on Summit and then stay on Summit up to Lee Street and then go across Lee Street. We cha made that change because um, we wanted to strengthen the opportunity for some existing businesses in there to be adjacent to this trail. There's some interesting history in there. Uh, it's where Mary Tipcom, the founder of the Bookmobile, uh, lived. There's some things like that that we could kind of play off on on the trail. The traffic so, island. The traffic island that is, uh, you'll see a little bit later there, at, um, that is kind of, right now, just a kind of a space that's not doing a whole lot. So we're suggesting that alignment on the south end. And on the north end, I'm sorry, um, on the north end, up by Antietam Street, the alignment that we think makes sense is that if we went past the district court, either on the west side or the east side of district court, but preferably the west side in that grass alley, it's a private alley that the district court owns, it takes you right to the building that we just tore the back off of at 4347 West Washington Street. If you could imagine going through that building, like the Potomac Walk building is down on South Potomac Street, if you go through that building where you come out, you're standing looking at directly across at University Plaza and the brick walkway that already exists that takes you over to the farmer's market. And, and, and that choice that you just presented us with was the almost unanimous choice of the people who attended that meeting that you mentioned at the beginning of your comments. That's a good point. They really, they really like that they idea. They really liked it, loved that yeah. idea. Yeah. So if we can make that happen, that might be our plan A. If we can't, you know, maybe we could use one of the alleys or something, but it seems to have to make some sense. Mayor Reichel then showed different opportunities for places to have uh, wayfaring signs because obviously this isn't like a straight shot. <laughs> it's not a super highway. This kind of weaves and turns a little bit through um, the existing properties. So wayfinding signs are very important. So they show those on the next slide. And they also show opportunities for art. And I think they show 11 different places where they're suggesting that we could come up with art. Now, it's not gonna be right away, but I think it's something that we could work on over time is to develop art along these different places. They also show four main gathering areas or seating areas along the trail. Uh, the primary one is uh, the one that I mentioned that's actually right now owned by the Herald Mail that's kind of directly east of the county office building, right beside the car wash that's being rebuilt. Uh, that's the biggest area. Also in the Hagerstown Housing Authority property, there's an uh, opportunity there. There's a small opportunity up by the Antietam Paper Building, you'll see in a minute. And then down at the uh, city park, there's another one I'll show you in a minute as well. They also kind of gave like four overall themes of what the corridor, the different segments are going to have. The first, if I start at City Park, uh, that general theme down there is a little bit more urban, I think you would say. It's, it's, it'd be more along the Summit Avenue, it's along the street, but it gives you the opportunity to support some of those businesses down there and maybe have uh, even more businesses there. And then, um, when you turn and go through the uh, private properties starting at Ellsworth, the Hagerstown Housing Authority, and the Herald Mail, to me it's more of a green corridor then. I think it's a trail that has trees along it. The park itself uh, will have a lot of green features to it, and it has a little bit different feel than the first part. Then the last part, as you get into the downtown, obviously has another different feel to it, and it could be it's more uh, urban again along the street, 
or if we go through that building that we talked about, um, that part of the trail would have yet another feel to it. So they, there's some themes there, but the center of it would be more of a natural green trail. So then they just started to throw some very basic ideas out uh, of what could be done. And I want to point out right away that this is the alley um, along the plum, but this really isn't in our first phase uh, plan. But if we can't go through the building and we want to use the alley, there are things you can do to alleys to make them more attractive. And this is just some basic things. There's also some pictures later on on the packet that I won't go into a lot of detail on, but there's some alleys that are shown in there that are actually pretty attractive and how they treated them. Okay. And lighting's going to be very critical. Right. That's Absolutely, for, especially for an alley. Have to, maybe even daytime lighting, people psychologically need that well-lit. That, that amount of light. Yeah. And, and aware that there's cameras or whatever. Right. Uh, these two, this slide on the left shows what some improvements that could be made on the right, on the east side of district court. That's uh, the district court building uh, over here that we could use that brick walkway and widen it a little bit uh, and improve that area. That's again, if we can't go along the other side of district court on the west side that goes straight in through the building that we, that we're, we own or are remodeling. It's just an idea for that. But what is now in phase one is on the right now we're showing, um, this is on Antietam Street and the, on the left here is the city's parking lot and on the right is some of the buildings you were talking about earlier that are coming down. So it's just basically making an initial connector uh, over to the end of the A&E district down by the library and the German restaurant. So just making some basic landscaping improvements in there and uh, taking the people, directing them on the north side. But the trail itself really under phase one begins at this location and that's the Antietam paper building on the left and on the right is the Herald Mail building. So right now this is a very, I'll just say a very unattractive piece of land. Uh, it's an old rail line. You can see the pieces of the rail still in there and uh, it's just pothole ridden and park for, uh, jury duty. exactly and district court. So the proposal would be to take the trail down through that corridor, through property that we would obtain from the Herald Mail, and have a first opportunity would be here for art uh, on that corner to kind of be like a gateway feature along this corridor. And, and the packet is also a plan view that basically shows some bench seating and a piece of artwork here on the end. Then as you continue, now we're heading south um, and we go down the Antietam paper buildings here in the background. So this is down by almost the car wash and you turn around and you're looking back towards the downtown. That's kind of what the, the schematic would be of that greenway trail I was talking about before. Tree line path, benches, lots of lighting, those kind of things. The slide on the right, or the, I'm sorry, the exhibit on the right is just showing the uh, intersection down at the county office building of Hood Street and uh, Baltimore Street with some additional landscaping just to make it look more attractive. Now I think the main component of the trail might be this park which is again right off of the um, between the county office building and the uh, car wash. So the car wash is right here immediately adjacent to it. So the trail comes down from the downtown it goes down through this site and what they're showing is just kind of a, a, a ringed path through here. It's a very long and skinny site. Uh, but the idea would be to have uh, like a shade structure over here, some sort of children's interactive area right here. That would be, there's some pictures later on that I'll show you quickly. But that's kind of the focal point of this area. A gathering space, some landscaping and mounding of, of uh, the uh, soil in that area and to try to make that uh, just a, uh, a nice park feature. It's not huge, but it's, um, uh, I think you could do something really nice in there. Then we continue on, and now we're going down through the Hagerstown Housing Authority's property. Um, this is not the uh, existing circle where the, if you've noticed, the, the Mill Street um, gas station's um, cupola is, that's not this, that's 
back this way a little bit, but we would skirt along the side of that circle that's down there now, if you can imagine in your minds what that looks like. This is just another opportunity that they're suggesting that, it, you know, this is a longer straightaway down through here, is places that you'd want to have art, maybe you could bump out a little area and put a piece of art with some landscaping around it. It's just, it's just kind of a concept of how art could be incorporated on the trail. This is down at Summit Avenue, and the suggested idea here would be, uh, you know, you've, you've gone past Ellsworth, you've turned on Lee Street, now you're out to Summit, and you're looking down towards um, City Park. And we would probably, I'm sorry, we would push the wrong button. There we go. Probably take the east side curb line and move it into the street, widen the sidewalk in there to make it effectively like a trail and it would go down and connect to the trail that we just built along Memorial Boulevard. They're also suggesting over time we could do a little bit more with that triangular, triangular shaped island down there. Um, this is the Georgia Boy Restaurant. This is the um, so, Vir Virginia Avenue. This is Summit Avenue. Is that island in our right of way? It is. It's, we it's, own that and maintain I always wondered about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not real exciting right now mm. <laughs> and they get in some pictures just to kind of what your appetite of different things these are the alleys that we're talking about um, and then also some of the landscaping um, you know I envision like the the trail down um, past the car wash I think it could you know look like something like this over time where it would have a path with lots of greenery along the side um, this is lighting and seating, and I'll talk about how much we've planned for that in the future in a minute here. But uh, they use a lot of this, they propose a lot of this bench seating like this, which is something we did in Memorial Park uh, that we just built. Um, then this is the play area and the kind of the focal point of that park. Uh, here's a children's splash pad, could be one idea. Here's another type of splash pad. Uh, here's a waterfall or water feature that uh, attracts people. Um, or this is some of the massing of land they talk about is just building up mounds that kids play on. Uh, I don't know if this is the right place for that, but um, we could do some of those kind of things. Uh, this is ideas of art. Uh, there's all different kinds of art. I've learned a lot about art in the last few weeks about this. It's not just a statue. <laughs> there's <laughs> wall poetry, there's sound art, there's um, um, musical, swings. musical swings, there's art that you paint on the sidewalk. Uh, there's a suggestion about uh, painting, having uh, like BISFA students painting blocks of the path down through the park, all kinds of things. Uh, some more permanent art and permanent mural ideas. And then also, of course, the very important would be signage, which we don't have a final design on, but obviously we need some really quality, kind of interesting wayfinding signage. The pavement itself, we're thinking, would be concrete, but maybe something that's uh, a little more interesting than just a sidewalk, uh, maybe some textured concrete or something like that. And then I also talked about shade structures in the park. This is kind of two examples of wooden shade structures that could be kind of the focal point of that park um, somehow. And then the rest of the information, I won't get through all that, but this is just information from the workshop and some of the summary of all that was done that evening. I put together a cost estimate and that's in your packet and I'd be happy to go over that with you. I did want to point out um, a few things on that. First, we put in $200,000 for lighting, which is an estimate that was given to me by City Light, and that's, a, I think, a, uh, a generous number, especially if we can incorporate some of the existing light that's in there, but it goes back to what Councilman Brubecker said. We have $60,000 in there for um, uh, cameras, which is, uh, I think, a reasonable amount of money for a, um, a camera system. I put 100000 in there for park development um, and just to try to get some of the, uh, the park started. And I put 25000 in there for art. Um, that's just the basics. But over time, I think we'll need to seek grants and opportunities every chance we get to try to 
uh, add art along the trail. We were thinking as staff that the art component of this uh, could be something that we would engage the um, A&E board on because they represent our arts community and maybe they could give us some more feedback as to what kind of art to do first and, and where to do it and, and so on. Um, as far as the schedule goes, you know, we're still trying to put this together so we can put it out to bid uh, early next summer and try to get this under construction next year. And as far as names go, Man Reichel gave us a list of names that you can look over and if you have any feedback on those, I'd love to hear it. So that's everything I had to say, so I'd love to hear what you want to say. And Ronnie, just to be clear, this doesn't represent what we would see as a completed trail but, well, the, the trail itself, the walking path would be completed. Right. The artwork, the amenities would evolve over time. Mm -hmm. But we also try to include enough that we've got more than just a walking trail here because we feel like when it opens, we have to have some attractions there. We want to we want to make some, yeah, some right. sizzle, make a statement. So we've tried to beef up the, the budget and the project to include some of those initial efforts at art and play areas and attractions for residents. Yep. It's really interesting how much interest there's been from uh, potential investors for properties along this trail ever since we've rolled it out. And uh, as far as the name goes, I like just the link. I mean, it might have like a bigger name, but I think people aren't going to call it some big fancy name. They're going to have some mm -hmm. short little name for it. and. Could we do it? The A&E link would be sort of what I would... Renaissance Way and make a contest out of it or something? Yeah, that's perfectly possible. Well, I mean, I, I guess none of them jump out. I'm, I'm not saying I have an alternate suggestion. I just... None of them jump out at me right now. At least me. I don't know anybody else, but... I just think I, of the A&E link as yeah. linking the A&E district in the downtown with right. what I always refer to as the second A&E district at City Park. Right. But, but, but I have some questions on the, on the earlier stuff. If go ahead. We're open for that. I, uh, Ronnie, what is the uh, funding sources for the 1.3 million? Uh, we have uh, 365,000 from the proceeds from the sale of the U.S. Army building and the balance would be bond proceeds. Balances bonds, so about a million, a little mm -hmm. less. And I do have some contingency built in there. Yeah. And then there's some of those things that. You have contingency, yeah, right here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm not. You know, it. It seems to me this needs to be secure and inviting from the get-go. I don't think Rodney knows enough yet about what, how, where the landscaping is going to be. How you know to. These are just ballparks at the moment. Mm -hmm. not, not putting you down, but yeah, that's no, your it's, basically very, very early into the design. Yeah, very early. Yeah, and I, you know, I think this is something where it almost needs to be right from the from the get go, because people are going to either accept it or dismiss it around here. And if it if it's not accepted, it, it's going to be hard to overcome that. You know, if people don't feel right about it. I mean, I'm looking at that greenery. I don't know how you managed to do that, but that would be, to me, more inviting than just brick walls everywhere you go, you know, and streets mm -hmm. and, and things like that. But there's not much room in the right of way. So it's really, to me, a difficult design challenge to make it both inviting, which is critical, and secure at the same time. And also keep in mind that it's going to be the center of hopefully future housing development. Well, well. I, I'm thinking of that was another mm -hmm. point I had that we got to make sure that uh, that we keep working on that and we, we keep trying to bring that in. I know that's phase two, but well, it's important though that we put any planning of utilities in there now. So right. We've already met with water and sewer, electric, and um, others to plan that because. We don't want to tear something but, up. But there might, yeah, okay, but the, the, right, and there might become sites available that we would, we didn't predict in the urban partners study. Mm -hmm. I mean, somebody, who knows? I mean, yeah. m maybe the trolley barns come down. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I'm just, if it works, you know. Mm -hmm. Maybe enough. So, but, I guess in a way, I think this is something that long-term funding 
is applicable to because if it it's got to work over the long term to be right i think we should aim to go to farmers market because one of the things i said was we got to figure a way to link farmers market better to the rest of downtown mm -hmm. so people go to that and then see oh there's downtown over there you know um, and to, to me this fits into it but i think you have physical issues on how to do that well, we certainly have the building issue to deal with. Yeah, the, well, that. But yeah. the farmer's market aside, let's say that works. Mm -hmm. the, the physical part of getting out to downtown, it seems to me, is and making that inviting is, is difficult. Mm -hmm. But Mr. I do Alshire. agree with trying to link the farmer's market. Okay. Mr. Alshire and then Mr. Munson. Um, so about a half, probably about a half dozen times a week. Um, morning, afternoon. Uh, last night it was about midnight. Um, I go from my house uh, there on Virginia Avenue to uh, about the mayor's house um, and then back around uh, to Bester and then home, uh, which I guess includes a bit of this link. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd like to think that I see it in uh, a light that I think that this type of plan tries to envision seeing it in. Um, and I think that Marty made a very good point uh, on one of the tenets that I see is that if you're going to invest this type of funding, it has to work. It has to be accepted. Mm -hmm. um, and just for this leg, you know, because I have some degree of excitement about talking about, you know, that entire sort of filtering, if you will, of, of, of being able to walk uh, through through town, you know, proper in, in that capacity. Um, if you go back to the, in the way I sort of envision in my head as I go about it is, uh, you know, I see it as sort of one large broken window. And unless you fix the window, there's no reason to put curtains up. Uh, that's the best way I can say it. And so at the end of the terminus in this particular leg, which I would say I, I probably walk this area probably at least four nights a week, um, is the property we bought on the north segment. And I completely agree, and I've said it, I think, since before we bought the property, that we've got to be able to punch that through. Mm -hmm. Because once you get through, then you get to the university, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the area beside the broad axe, out to the, the county market, or county market, the, 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 um, uh, the farmer's the market, market, and then, and then further north. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, and I usually take that way, and then I'll come up to uh, where the, uh, the the Cannon Park is, mm -hmm. uh, and then up Potomac, and then up that way toward your place where nobody stops at the stop signs. Um, but that, I think, has to happen, and we, we have secured the property now and have the ability to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody agrees that that's a key component. Uh, so that, for me, is, is, is Ahead of the art and ahead of the sidewalks and ahead of those things, that has to be incorporated. It has to be an integral piece of the plan that happens. The second piece, which you rightly note, is this, uh, the, this central linear park, if you will, of the area that, that is uh, uh, bordering the old Antietam, whatever that company Paper. was, paper company. And that has to happen or nobody's going to accept, including myself, to want to walk through that space when I can walk along the sidewalk uh, on Summit Avenue. It's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. That, uh, I think, has to be a, a central focal point of the two terminuses. Mm -hmm. And uh, in your rendition on how to get there in the southern end, um, I would say that, gosh, of the, 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 you know, the countless times now that, that, that I've walked this uh, area, you know, even when we lived on Highland Way, I, I would walk this probably half a dozen times a week. Um, nobody, nobody goes down to the, uh, I guess, what would you consider to be Summit Avenue Extended, uh, what I would call extended, uh, on the back portion of uh, 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 right there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so nobody, I, nobody I does that. I mean, I, I've walked this a thousand times. Nobody does that because the obvious choice is to take the safer route, and people generally feel safer either going Walnut or even the, even the, 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 the Hill of Prospect because the environment 
the neighborhood itself feels safer to walk in that direction, uh, even though even though it's it's either a longer way around or it's it's a more elevated, you know, taxing way to walk, because you've got, in my visual uh, opinion, an impediment right at that triangle. And if can you do you have a picture yeah. of that triangle? That building's like a brick wall. And that little segment there is like a brick wall for people that want to traverse. And this gets to Marty's point of it's got to sell. It's got to be accepted. I would venture that if we could acquire that property, it removes what I believe to most pedestrians coming from the south end into downtown as that visual impediment, removing that from the equation and then provides a true link. And I, you, know, you could use POS acquisition funds. I mean, it's basically a, a garage that, that you know, could, could go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, but to me is a key piece of property mm -hmm. in linking City Park to, to, to any success that you would have with this path. It just is. Trailer park is more of an impediment uh, than this place. Well, the trailer park is, is, is uh, off center. They've paved the lot. Uh, you know, they've put the fencing up. I mean, it, 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 aesthetically, that trailer park has come a it's long be way. the nicest looking trailer park <laughs> we can get. Well, it, all I'm saying is it's come a long way for, from its, its appearance even five or six years ago. But this property and for pedestrians, I think, coming from the south end and trying to make that walk and, you know, leave City Park and even want to, you know, uh, to take that walk. I think is impeded by the, the, the appearance of this. And as you even noted, you know, it's not the, the sort of the most welcoming triangle, if you will, because mm -hmm. uh, it... it uh, so you're saying to invest in this triangle would be sort of futile if you don't address the use that's currently there. I'm saying that if you don't obtain that triangle, right. you will not create the connection that you're looking for for pedestrians to leave City Park and come into the south end of downtown. And I do know that staff bef prior to this uh, trail plan came coming in was looking at sort of a Summit Avenue uh, improvement, if you will. And that's and, sort of along and, where, where this idea of linking this into the trail came in to improve that and, uh, aesthetic along well, Summit. And I think that this triangle poses two key components to getting people to turn, because I completely agree, I don't like walking Summit Avenue just as a walker mm -hmm. in that area. I, I love the idea of the path going through uh, uh, between uh, uh, the Ellsworth and, and the Housing Authority property. I think that's great, and I think that it clearly begs for that central park that you've shown. Mm -hmm. But this triangle, I guess I see in the bigger picture, you've got two, like rest gateway. You've got two restaurants that flank it, mm -hmm. that, that have had some uh, negligible, uh, you know, amount of success and turnover, and nobody's going to take a right there at Chick's Seafood mm -hmm. uh, unless, I guess in my mind, what I envision is you obtain this property and you open it for sort of outside seating, uh, uh, an enjoyment area that those two restaurant establishments may benefit from some outside like a little type of, of appearance too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, because you know you got the Sicilian, which is going in, which is all paved. I mean, there's no real sort of outside area, and then you've got Chick Seafood that I don't, I don't, I don't know. I've never eaten there, but but I what? It, yeah, it's definitely not never the, mo the most there? visually ap appealing. But they've got this really cool uh, um, concrete slate type Patio. area in the seafood? back. Mm -hmm. And all I'm saying is if you could link the Sicilian with this open space, and, and I'm using the Sicilian just as the term of, of the moment of, of what you know, Park Circle and, and the others have been, but if you could link those two restaurants with those two types of pieces of open space, then I think you could get people to leave that curvature of the city park and move into that space mm -hmm. and get them a half block closer okay. then to that path to get them downtown. Okay. I, I just think that if you don't, make that linkage at the southern terminus, 
I think, as Marty said, it isn't going, I don't know how you turn, but it isn't going to. It needs to be secure. Yeah, it, 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 it's it, not going yeah, to work. It's got to work from the get-go. It's my, it's my yes. point. To so what I hear some of you saying is and, that and maybe I'm willing, spend you know, a little more money up front to make it If we have to spend more money up successful. front. But I think I, you I can buy that POS to, acquisition away. funds, you know, to make if it they're right. available uh, for that purpose. And I don't know that the, the value of that property can be astronomical. Mr. Munson. Ronnie, I first want to congratulate you on this presentation. You've come a long, long way since that meeting. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and a very good presentation. Um, <clears throat> I agree with much of what, um, what uh, the two previous speakers have talked about. But I think the key to making this successful is for the people who will be walking it to be absolutely assured that they're safe. Now, I know that you mentioned putting cameras up. I think that's a great idea. The more, the better. But I also think the police are going to need a plan. And I don't know if there's been any discussions about that yet. Yes, there is. Um, to guarantee the safety of people who are walking us. I met with Jerry Kendall, and we're looking at the, the SEPTED um, design. Um, issues that that, uh, that he's very aware of. So he was giving me a lot of good pointers that we're trying to incorporate. Well, I think that really needs to be thought out thoroughly because the first incident on this trail is going to really hurt, mm -hmm. hurt it. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, that what Kristen has been saying about the restaurants down there is absolutely accurate. Uh, I was down there, I think, yesterday. There's a sign down there that says new Italian restaurant coming mm -hmm. where the Georgia boy used to be. Okay. I believe that that uh, that will enhance the use of the trail, the fact that that eatery will be there. Although, they, as the mayor just mentioned a couple of minutes ago, that area certainly needs to be cleaned up uh, around the, the trailer park. And... Um, I, I really agree with Kristen 100% that it needs to go through the building. We have got to make some, make that, that work. Okay. That walk that was put in from the city market past the post office mm -hmm. um, was put in there during the Paddock administration. That was in the 70s in an attempt to and enhance the walking people from, from the, the city market to downtown and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think ultimately, as another phase, that's going to have to be rehabilitated some because it's certainly been a long time since uh, yeah. it's uh, had any work done on it. Okay. But it's still, it makes a perfect opportunity to get from city market it's to downtown or interblock pedestrian yeah. traffic it so you have to go all around either way right mm -hmm. right but um, this is a great plan now one other thing one of the things that I've always enjoyed about Inner Harbor is that often they have these groups of people at Inner Harbor putting on some sort of activity that's pretty interesting mm -hmm. um, whether it's a skateboard demonstration or, or a singing group or something like that. Mm -hmm. There needs to be areas that are large enough along our trail to permit the same thing, I think. Okay, some sort of programming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have the I mean, little tiny theater, the rounded mm -hmm. brickwork at the Inner Harbor that's, that people right. in. A little amphitheater or something. It's not that large, but it's... Can I give you an example of this southern terminus? I mean, you saw the excitement of folks that are interested in this process of being able to punch through 43 at the northern terminus because they see that you know the benefit. I, I just see the southern terminus, I guess, with that same level of, of approach. But I mean, we're going to be doing a, a, the tree lighting and the park lighting, you know, two weeks from now. I mean, everybody crams in, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a space about the size of this room, and, and I envision, you know, this area being able to expand people out into that for those those types of activities again. You know, that, that sort of linkage between the two pieces, uh, I, I just, you know, 
And I, I think that, that, that's a, that that's a critical component. Okay. There's also been some suggestions for a street name change down around the southern terminus down there. And, and that's maybe a very good idea as well. Well, originally we were going to use that little piece of Hood Street yeah. that, um, how do I describe it? it it's, um, it's, there's a piece of Hood Street and there's another piece of Hood Street up by the county office building and there was a suggestion to rename the lower one. I think it's a, there shouldn't be two separate Hood Streets. One mm -hmm. of them should be renamed, so we'll work on that. Mm -hmm. But we're not proposing to take the trail down that anymore, uh, for, especially for youth going through this triangle. Yeah, I think to try and get people behind the chick seafood in, in into that side street yeah. uh, that is uh, to me uh, like walking through a hallway yeah. uh, and and it's just not yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've never went down and said man I should go this direction it right. just the flow doesn't you know what I mean yeah. uh, but but I think the flow through that area on both sides of that you know well, are, yeah, are and inviting. Chicks and Park Circle are both well known places right mm -hmm. uh, the chicks have stayed right, the same the frontage on the trail yeah right mm -hmm. Yeah, like Kristen's did on. Yeah. Any Lee other? Street's going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, once you get beyond that, you know, Lee Street itself is going to be to make it inviting to mm -hmm. link it in. You know. Which is why I said if you could if you could do this on this terminus and then link it to Chicks that that has the opportunity to open open up that that back area, yeah. like I said, which is a really cool area. I don't know what they use it for, huh. uh, but but if you had outside seating back there, you know, for for a crab place, I you know I envision it that type of successful venture being similar to, you know, what Stadium does. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this goes right there. Stadium yes. Tavern. Mm -hmm. so. aren't, aren't there a fairly large number of, of uh, grant programs to help fund this? I mean, you, you, you listed some of them in this document, well, but, um, but I know um, some programs are more popular than others. Uh, yeah. and I think we just have to uh, throw, go after everything we can and see what sticks. Uh, There's one like the SGIF, the Strategic, strategic Demolition money. Uh, okay. Just today, Emily McFarland helps me work on grants and she gave me the one on the National Endowment of the Arts. It's a $200,000 grant. I'm sure it's heavily sought after, but mm -hmm. that's the kind of stuff we need to work right. to mm -hmm. go after and things we haven't used before well, to try to go after. And so. Emily, you got a good person looking. Yeah, she's, she's very good. Any other feedback or questions on this? I just concur with everything you said on the front of Oh, one last comment, art. Most, I think most folks don't realize, especially folks uh, uh, probably my age uh, uh, and younger, the number of, and I've said this to Bispa a number of times, the number of, uh, in fact, right around the corner, I think, is where they made that chemical um, kids set, right? Am I, am I wrong about that? That was up along the railroad tracks near the Brant, where the Terrace Liquors is. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there were several, I guess, car the Porter chemical vehicle. Porter chemical. Porter chemical. Yeah. yeah. There was some vehicle manufacturing uh, in, in this area. All I'm saying is I think that a, an interesting uh, art theme for a park like this would be for kids to create permanent sculpture artwork that represents a, you know, one of the vehicles from the manufacturing uh, 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 entity that made it at the time or, or Hagerstown legacy stuff. I, yeah I, I just yeah I mean we had 15 or 20 you know things that are made here at, at one point in time it'd be cool if there was a park that accentuated those things yes. yeah. legacy art yeah okay hmm. good idea anything else are you okay with us engaging the Annie board to help us with the art component? I think that's an, an excellent idea mm-hmm Absolutely. What would be the next steps then, Rodney? No official actions required at this time, just getting input? Well, I think I'm hearing pretty clearly what the alignment should be. So we can um, now start doing the hard engineering, so to speak, of the trail layout through those different areas. I, in this particular area where this triangle is, um, staff's going to put our heads together and figure out how we can accomplish what uh, the council's saying. So that'll be the next thing. And just a suggestion, you know, you, you gave a, a proposal for a name there that's uh, very planned, uh, sort of describes the connection. But just in a little discussion, think of a name such as the Art Walk, which suddenly 
describes the walk, makes it sort of the art walk. And I'm not saying that's the name, but mm -hmm. something that would get people to want to go there and see what it is. Exactly. I think it's a good idea to maybe have a contest, again, to just keep interest you know, to keep continuing to generate interest in this project, and also, I mean, there's yeah, that would generate who, interest. In who knows well. what kinds of yeah. ideas we'll get? Yeah. yeah. This is all really good feedback, so we'll keep working. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you. We are going to take a break and reconvene in 15 minutes. You can do it. You can do it. Welcome back, everybody, for the second half, if you will, of our meeting tonight. It's nice to take a break. Uh, the next item on the agenda is Parks and Rec Initiatives to Heal Cities and Towns for the Mid-Atlantic Campaign. Amy Riley, our Recreation Coordinator, and Rodney Tissue, the best city engineer in the country, are going to come up and <laughs> talk about that. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, we are happy to be here to report on some new initiatives for the Parks and Recreation Division. Um, we have been working really hard to help make Hagerstown a more healthier community, and we do have some new programs in place that we'd like to talk about tonight. One of them is that we've been working really hard um, since summertime to implement a new Parks and Recreation software program through the active network. You may or may not be familiar with the active network. It is used, um, used throughout the country. A lot of parks and recreation departments use this software with the goal of making pavilion, facility rentals, and activity registration easier for customers and for staff. Some of the features of the active software, one of them being is the facility scheduling software which simplifies park facility scheduling for customers and staff. When it's easier to book a band shell or a pavilion, we are more likely to fill our facilities and rentals. So that's gonna be a, a nice um, feature to have in the office to help with those reservations. Um, having online access will allow us to meet the digital needs of our community. They'll be allowed to manage their own accounts. They'll be able to go in and sign up for activities like the Hub City 100 Miler and at the same time, they could register for a pavilion or rent the band shell. We also were able to implement a new point of sale software through the active network that will help staff um, make transactions much easier at the golf course and at Potterfield Pool. We actually went live with the POS software on November 5th, and it's been a, a nice transition. We are able to pull up real-time reporting um, we can see the activity happening at the golf course, and we're able to keep a great inventory now of all the items at the pro shop. Again, we're, at, we're able to pull real-time reports, um, which is a really nice feature of the ActiveNet. That will help us with trends. It will help improve our marketing, and we'll just be able to make better decisions about our business operations through the Active Network. So we encourage you to go to the Parks and Rec webpage, and if you click on the link for Active, you'll be able to see um, the features that are there. You'll be able to rent a pavilion. We rent six months out. We are active now, so you can rent a pavilion for the next 180 days. I don't know if you'd like to add anything all to All online. That. You could um, re reserve it and pay for it all online. I was just looking on my mobile device for that page, and is this, are we still having issues because the city's website in general is not mobilely compatible, but I had a hard time finding it on my mobile device. I think I have to turn to Aaron on that one. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I know, I frequently <laughs> complain to Aaron about how <laughs> not friendly our right. website is with mobile devices. So what we've done as a workaround in terms of uh, navigation, ease of use on the mobile website, is making things appear with the quick links. Um, and that's starting to become a little overpopulated. So as we're phasing this in, as we're phasing other things that are pertinent to the community right now, 
we're finding other places for shortcuts to them for ease of use on the website. And then longer term, we're looking at trying to either convince our current provider to get with the program with mobile devices or we'll go shopping for another one, right? That would be correct. Thanks. This is really good though. Yeah, because we're I mean, excited. It's good for not only operations, but for the ease of access for the public to get to rent yeah. facilities and otherwise know what's going on. So. Definitely. I'd also like to thank Michelle Hepburn with finance and IT department. They've been a huge help putting this all together. We've worked a lot of hours on it, so I want to thank them. Definitely been busy. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say something? I'm just working for a small municipality, managing only a couple of. <coughs> managing and scheduling a couple of facilities. Uh, I have a great appreciation for the convenience this software probably uh, offers. Yes, we it <laughs> will it will help us a lot. Yeah. Which leads into the next item, which is we are getting ready to launch the 2015 Hub City 100 miler. We had over 650 participants last year, and actually we lost um, close to 100 participants that weren't able to register online right away because we weren't able to capture their, their payment when they registered. So we're hoping that the active network will allow us to bring in some new milers this year and actually capture them when they register. So that registration opens on November 28th, and um, it kicks off officially on January 7th. The goal is to complete 100 miles in 100 days. So you could do a mile a day, or you could skip a day and do two miles the next day, but it's, um, the ultimate goal is 100 miles or more. And we have some new partners this year with FedEx Ground. Heal of Washington County is behind the effort, uh, the Washington County Health Department, and Mercury Endurance is going to be sponsoring uh, two grand prizes this year that we actually raff we actually had one grand prize last year was a multi-use sports bike but this year we have two sports bikes as grand prizes and we're also um, everyone's eligible for weekly prizes as well so we're Hopefully really it won't be as cold as it was last year on january 7th yes we hope not but amy in that one we had a lot of enthusiasm and we a did. lot of participation yeah. Really 2014. Great. We did. We had a lot of letters coming in after the event, emails just saying how much they love the program, and so we're really hoping that the community is behind it again. People I think in surrounding great. areas who say they wish their town or community would do something similar. So. Right. So that is coming up. Is this the time frame where the actual registration is from November 28th to January 7th? Correct. What's the time frame for the 100 miles? Uh, January 7th through April 16th. And we will be doing a kickoff again on the 7th. We are also, in general, looking to develop more recreation programs throughout the 2015 calendar year. With the opportunity with the golf course being closed in the months of January and February, we've been creative in looking for indoor rec facilities to host programs. So while we don't have an indoor rec facility yet, which we are looking to possibly uh, make a room out at the grandstand and the fairgrounds as an indoor, a four season indoor rec facility. But in the meantime, we're getting creative and programming some yoga classes at the golf course clubhouse in January and February. And those classes will be announced on the active network as well. We're Can also. You, just real quick, because yeah. my curiosity is just killing me right now. What is glow flow yoga? <laughs> it's actually glow in the dark yoga. Huh. We'll be replacing the lights in the clubhouse with black lights, and we're encouraging participants to wear clothing that will bring that will go in the dark. And mm. it's open to all ages, and it's going to be more fun. It's yoga, but it's going to be fun. Like so, you're assuming most people have clothing that glows in the dark. Psychedelic. That's psychedelic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Thank so you. Something different, and we're having partners yoga. Yeah. <laughs> Partners Yoga will be launched right before Valentine's Day, and um, we have an eight-week yoga for weight loss class that we're going to be hosting. But we're also looking for instructors in the community that could teach programs for us. So whether, whether it be in an indoor setting like the clubhouse or in an outdoor setting in the spring and summer, we're, we're looking for instructors to bring some new programs to Parks and Rec. We're also a recipient of a $10,000 grant from the Washington County Health Department that will enable us to support programs like the Hub City 100 Miler 
and some new programs that we're hoping to bring to fruition in 2015 with the ultimate goal of increasing physical activity over the next nine months. Great. Lastly, in follow-up to the Maryland Municipal League's conference in 2014 and at the mayor's recommendation, the Recreation Division has been working with the Mid-Atlantic Heal Organization. This is not to be confused with the local Heal, which we also partner with. But there's actually a Mid-Atlantic Heal Organization, and there's a campaign that we've been drafting with their help that will articulate our municipality's commitment to a healthier Hagerstown. This resolution will highlight the programs and goals we already have in place, and the campaign will guide us to create new ones. And you do have a draft of that resolution in the packet. We hope that the mayor and council will formally adopt this resolution and the city will become a member of the Hill Cities and Towns campaign. Um, the city will then be eligible for technical assistance, staff time, information on funding opportunities, and we have special recognition at future, at future Maryland Municipal League events. And that is all. So I'd ask that you uh, review the resolution and hopefully pass it next week. Any, any objections to that? Nope. Wonderful. Good work. Keep it up. I have a question of Rodney, and it has nothing to do with that. It has to do, I'm seeing gatekeepers, house renovation. Mm -hmm. By the time that comes to pass, if it's not soon taken care of, it's going to be on the ground. Do we know when um, hmm, the entrance building is going to be looked at again? As far as uh, looked at to renovate well, it? As, uh, yeah, because at, the, at one point I think it was like over a million and some dollars. Mm -hmm. But still, exactly. with that having the history is what it does, it's, it's about maintenance now, just mm -hmm. keeping up with what we have. Right. We did do some maintenance, I'm sure you saw up front there. We replaced some of the uh, terribly deteriorated sidewalks. And yeah, the sidewalks, but I know yeah. the, the painting has got to be. It's been a while, hasn't it, Junior? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're scheduled to repaint it in another year or so, and mm. um, um, every so often we need to go through the building and just to make sure that it's still right. structurally sound. Because that's the only one that's left, and I forget what the region is, but mm -hmm. that's the existing one. Okay. We'll that Lou and Susan and everybody else wanted it to burn down with lightning. <laughs> remember? I with you. Remember? I know you were, but remember you said when you would go buy it and Susan would go buy it. This was before I was in office. They just wanted it to be struck by lightning. <laughs> yeah. But we saved it. But anyway, I'm concerned about it. Are we talking it. about okay. the same? The entrance building. That's the gatekeeper's house? Yeah. Gatekeeper's is house is on the end. The entrance okay. building is beside it. Right, right. Okay. The gatekeep, the entrance building was once used for the railroad. Railroad. Mm -hmm. um, Christmas time. Christmas time and all. Yeah. yeah. So we've moved into the next item on the agenda. I'll um, just thank you. Um, please, <laughs> go ahead, Don. Uh, there was a talk show on uh, WJEJ this morning uh, in reference to health issues, and the Hagerstown programs were mentioned prominently during the talk show. Great. So people are starting to get the word. Good. Hope to do more. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so the next item is the program open space. Yeah, so we started talking about that a little bit. Junior and I kind of brainstorm a list of <coughs> requests that we thought might be appropriate, but uh, obviously we want you to review this. And um, what we need to do though is next week pass uh, a list by priority of the uh, A&E, I'm sorry, of the uh, POS projects that we want to do. Um, now this would be FY16, so this money doesn't come available until June of 2016. That's assuming that we make it through the county and you make it through the, the state. So this is a year and a half from now, if you can imagine that. So, um, so there's our list. Uh, we show by priority. What we came up with is uh, the continuation of what we talked about earlier with the A&E, the park, just having some more money to work there. Uh, we've been working with the Hazel League um, to have soccer lights on the one field, and we're <coughs> suggesting we use some of this money for that. We have another opportunity for another grant through the USA soccer association to get another uh, uh, I would say fifty to a hundred thousand dollars and then Hazel is possibly looking at funding the rest uh, but this would be some seed money to get that started there's been some discussion about skate parks 
uh, in the downtown specifically, whether or not we'd want to support that with some money here. Um, Junior's always concerned about the safety of our play equipment and uh, possibly uh, replacing some of that in City Park. In the dog park, um, you know, last couple nights we've noticed okay. before it got so cold, there's been over 20, almost 30 dogs in the dog park. That's too many. <laughs> we we need uh, maybe another alternative there. Um, it's it's being overused, I think. And then, um, uh, of course, keep grass on. Yeah. And then. Um, Again, Junior's always looking to add more pavilions, too, because they're revenue for us. Um, they'll be adding another pavilion for our That's our suggestions, but we're... Well, let me make a comment, please. Mm -hmm. um, I like your choices. They're top ten choices. But I also like the choice of a city, city park lake dredging. Mm -hmm. I mean, here it is. We're building, we're building a, what's going to turn out to be an expensive trail from Center City to City Park. Uh, it's the uh, most beautiful city park in America, um, and I think the dredging project is going to help keep that reputation. And I would like to see that project, frankly, moved up. Uh, uh, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of good projects, but that particular one, I think, uh, can really be justified. So, for what it's worth, that's my comment. On that project, I was going to put together a plan and come in and review that with you. Yeah, I, I, really I think that, I'm sure you read my email, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I'm not opposed to dredging. I need to make sure in, that it is environmentally feasible, you know, we don't uh, indirectly negatively impact our springs that feed it, mm -hmm. uh, that we don't poke a hole somewhere in a spot we don't know, mm -hmm. uh, may drain it, uh, you know, those types of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that the, that, that, that you need some discussion on its environmental impact. Right. Well, and the likelihood of us getting 450,000 through POS is pretty low. I mean, for instance, Kristen, are you finished? I'm, yep. What did we get last year? Um, I, I always ask it, Junior. 163. So. We got 163 last year. And we probably asked for. I think we're asking. Oh. We asked for several hundred thousand. Yeah, I don't I recall the number. 300. Like 300. 300. 330. We got yeah. 163. Right. And that's typical. And then doesn't, regardless of what order we put them in, don't the commissioners say, well, we like this, and, and they they don't necessarily take our top numbers and put what money they think is available. Not necessarily. Well, most of the time they go by a priority, but certainly if we have something that number three for 30,000 and something that number yeah. two for 150,000, it might go to the three just because that's right. all the money they got. Yeah. Or all the money they say they have. All the money. <laughs> I, 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 that's all. I'm, I'm just saying that the, the lake, up, uh, Dawn, I'm not saying it's not a good project. I'm just thinking not only will you have to plan it environmentally and engineering wise, we have to plan it fiscally too. I, yeah, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. But even the county commissioners have to realize that the most beautiful park in America is in right. Washington County. Right, but they hardly ever give us 450000 is my point. It's almost like mm -hmm. we take all our POS for two or three years. We don't get a fair proportion of POS. We, we, we just simply don't, but we don't have the leverage to do it. I mean, I say there in, needs to be state legislation, but I, I can't get anybody to follow on that either. In Frederick County, they split it 50-50, and then the 50% that's split to the municipalities, the municipalities decide how that 50% is split up among those 12 municipalities. Well, it just that that's you know so the county gets fifty percent of the money and then the twelve municipalities split the other fifty percent. Uh, and here, I is the board of education, mm -hmm. which I didn't. And I don't think yeah. the board of ed's included yeah. in that. Yes, huh. I, I would suggest, Mayor, that that the A and E number one is absolutely fine, given the fact that what we're being told is that we have a potential large private contribution for the soccer lights. It sounds like that would be a reasonable request, but I personally would move the dog park up before I would move the skate park. Um, the fact the fact that we made the investment in a dog park and it's so successful that we're risking ruining what we've created doesn't make sense. To have a dog park that turns into nothing but a mud hole is going to eventually mean what we've done is invested into our fairgrounds park only to find out that we've done a net negative. 
Where are you going to put another park I don't at? mind doing that, Where are you but put if it the at? second park is suggested to be in City Park, near the Hager House, and that turns into a similar uh, appearance, uh, I think that... I'm, I'm not making any suggestion yeah. for where it should I be, understand. But, but, but we need to have an understanding that we, we, we need to do something. We don't do another dog park. We need to figure out how to control what we have currently. And I don't know if that means maybe maybe it's cheaper to look for artificial turf in the dog park than, <laughs> than to deal with trying to maintain grass. I don't know, but, but I, I hate to see something have success kill it, that it be so successful that it becomes a net negative to that park. So however it works, but I, I don't know that I would put the skate park up there at this stage of the game unless you know, when I see a total project cost of $250,000, unless we have some way to fund that, we're looking at $30,000 in funding, and that leaves us with $220,000, we're in trouble if they give us the money, because then, then we have to find a place to fund it. So I, I personally would put the skate park at the bottom. Is, I, but I is this gonna be the skate park that, that's been talked about as far as the downtown? Because well, if it if things move, it's you know, it, that may happen more quickly than what you think. Is that the one in and conjunction with that economic, economic development, development yes. that we talked about? Yeah. See, that's what I'm saying. That yes. if that moves, that could well, move very quickly. Right. You're right. Well, and do we have two hundred and twenty thousand well, dollars to build it? I, no, I'm not saying that's that. That's my problem. Okay, because yeah. I don't know how much hmm, the outside. And I would also suggest before you start putting a request in for a quarter of a million dollar project in a neighborhood that you probably should talk to the neighborhood first. I mean, uh, you know, to talk, to talk about this kind of a, a thing without even having any public input into it on, on a neighborhood, I think is not a good idea. So that, that's my only comment. I just think that should go into the to the last, and, and either the dog park or the city park play equipment should should move up. How do you differentiate in your review process projects you may pull out for CPMP requested funding? Well, CPMP, there are CPMP more gears towards um, playground equipment, tables, benches. I know. I'm looking at this city park play equipment. Yeah. And to me, I mean, that's a prime candidate for CPMP. It will be on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you have it in both. Mm -hmm. I got you. Yes. Which I guess is an argument for putting it down on this list further, because um, chances are we'll get it for CPMP. Yes. But the Fairgrounds Park, some of the participating leaks you're saying might help offset that that cost? I think they'd have to. We're yeah. looking at a I mean, grant I'd, opportunity I'd BMX uh, through the National Soccer what? Association. I'd right. BMX lights that, up. Plus POS money, plus whatever they can come up it's with. It's there. would be there. It's built. Okay. It's functioning. So we're, we're uh, leveraging on that one. Right. But yeah, there's well, no guarantee we're going to get the grant, so it's out. a little bit of a roll of the dice there. Too. Yeah. Well, uh, let's say a project doesn't come to fruition. We can ask the commissioners, okay, that doesn't work. Let's move it down to number four. Mm -hmm. They generally go along with that once they lump. You see what I mean? Yes. We've changed so if a project doesn't yes. succeed, so I, I kind of I agree with Councilman Metzner's uh, suggestions. Uh, a and E leave A and E and uh, let leave the soccer field lights for second and move the dog park up. Third. And the other one, I guess I need to know more about the project and how it's linked to the to the other project and so forth. So that's what I would. And, and, and you know, when, when I see these requests. I, I don't know how the county works, but I would like to think that they would look at something like this and say, well, why should we fund it? You take a look at this, at the dog park and you have a success. You know that that's a, a needed thing. You take a look at the soccer field lights and we show as a need is that we and have- And it's a regional facility. Well, not only is it regional, but we have the potential in the soccer field lights. It is, it is anticipated to have private investment of potentially six figures. Those kinds of things I would like to think would would attract the commissioners to realize the need. Any walk one, soccer field two, dog park three. Realizing we have to conduct a site uh, 
another site task force or something. I'm uh, not agreeing to any site by agreeing. Right, no, it's Skate Park 5, Pavilion 6. How does the POS acquisition process work? And for land? Mm -hmm. For land acquisition. Oh, the last time I remember we did that was for the fairgrounds back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, because you have enough park space here, you're permitted to spend 100% of your funds on development, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to do any acquisition. Right. That's right. Because you've already met the acquisition attainment goals. Mm -hmm. That's right. But that doesn't keep you from asking for money from land. I, right. Mm -hmm. they, you can take up to 50% and put it toward acquisition right. uh, per the equation. All I'm saying is, I, I would yeah. reiterate, mm -hmm. as part of this A&E walking trail park development, that instead of one or more of these, you instead ask for some acquisition funding mm -hmm. for that property with POS purchase. How long has it been since, uh, jumping to 2017, how long has it been since the lake's been dredged? Does anybody know? <laughs> Junior, you probably goes back into your miss of memory. Yeah. So I don't think it's ever been dredged. Creates a permanent improvement. Yes. Mm -hmm. The upper See lake where I'm was, going? But it's a permanent improvement. We have a lot of work to do to find out. If I'm talking finish. about financing it. Oh. Right. It creates a permanent long improvement that's going to last 25 years or more. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So uh, maybe we can maybe that adds to the financing. But you have record of it actually being dredged. No. No. Okay. I mean, never that's yeah. that's my concern. We don't, right. If, if it, had it rain for the right, wall right for the wall. Except to remember that, but we we never. Yeah, I think it. there needs to be a lot of work done to find out whether it well, can be. Well, I'm not disagreeing with you either, Chris. I think we yeah. need to do that. But I'm trying. To, I, I agree with Vaughn. It needs to be done. I'm just trying to think, think of ways we can finance it and get it underway and, and do it and, and maybe not rely with on the POS end of it. Mm -hmm. It's think, rather a small chunk of it. I think we want to try to get it designed. And, and engage the person does dredging in the next fiscal year, and then dredging would well, be the year after. Well, I think that's to, a thought to, to do the <laughs> to answer a lot of your questions. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and try to put that in, and then yeah, dredging out a, a spring. We have some idea how to do the financial. Mm -hmm. plan. Yeah, your yeah. questions yeah. are very. Yeah. Yeah. Dredging out a spring yeah. head area, mm -hmm. I mean, could severely disrupt mm -hmm. the area in which that spring flow occurs. Yeah, I mean, that would hate to see the flow. Poke a hole, what mm -hmm. have out in Eddie Mountain Reservoir, eh? and suddenly <laughs> have a leak. Yeah. Uh, or send the water somewhere else. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. That's so we're at least clear on the list for FY16. We have the A&E Trail, number one, the Fairgrounds Park Soccer Field Lights, number two, the Dog Park, number three, City Park Play Equipment, number four, Skate Park, number five, and Fairgrounds Park Pavilion, number six. Is that right? Mm -hmm. We want to put a request in for acquisition money for the A&E Trail. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Yes. Absolutely. Well, does it send a message though? <laughs> if needed, I mean. Well, it doesn't matter because in the POS acquisition process, the way it works is you get two appraisals. You are only permitted to offer the property owner the median, middle, whatever the term is, of Mode. those two appraisals. So they come in at. Seventy-eight thousand and ninety thousand. You got to offer them the middle of that figure. It is. Yeah, a but case. right now we're hoping it's a public service, right? Well, I'm not, I'm not to be sure of that, right? No, the, the, I'm talking about the land that we need. And it's a public uh, donation. After all, we're enhancing the value of their property. <laughs> yeah, I'm not talking about. Yeah, that. Exactly. I'm talking he, about, the, about the, the property. The gas station that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that that's what you're thinking of. It, yeah. In addition to the others. Let's make that clear then. It's yeah, acquisition. In addition to the development money. The, yeah, the, we're talking about the triangle and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay, that. Okay, I'm sorry, yeah. I misunderstood. That's all right. I'll just remind you that it's June 2016 right. is the time frame on this. So. Yeah, but it takes a while to get to that negotiation process. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The appraisals and. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, why are we putting this, not putting the city park play equipment almost last if it's a CPP, if we've applied through another, another program? I'm going to flip four and six. Well, I'm just afraid we'll get it approved twice. I, and mm -hmm. Yeah, I know we can yeah. reallocate sure. the money, yeah. but. So flip four and six? Yeah. So four mm -hmm. would be the Fairgrounds Park Pavilion. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Five would be the skate park. Six would be the play equipment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. 
And I'm sorry, but both of my papers were stuck together. That's how I ended up with the entrance building <laughs> when I was flipping through it. I thought, OK, yeah. But anyway, I am concerned about the painting of that. If somebody yeah. can get back to me, please, because whatever we can do to get that started, I just don't want that wood to rot. We do make repairs to it. I know you do, Junior, but it just needs it. painted again. It's part of your home, Junior. It is. Front yard. <laughs> And we'll put in money for acquisition money too. For the A &D yeah, track. for that additional piece. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you for the direction. Thank you. Oh, oh, thank you. The next item is something that uh, I've been working with staff on, uh, mainly to provide direction for uh, city government for the next two years. A lot of this is. Uh, things that are already underway, but it's sort of packaged, you know, the discussions that we've had in the last two years, really, after we've set our vision and our mission, uh, and then really setting some goals and priorities uh, to, for the next two years, uh, especially as we move into uh, looking for a new city administrator. I mean, this is going to be crucial to, uh, I'm sure, our marketing efforts and um, not only that, but in terms of marketing for our economic development projects and just overall good governance. So um, it's broken down into these uh, seven uh, areas. Uh, I'm sure you all have had a chance to read over these, so I don't think we need to go through them point by point, but if anyone has any uh, anything that sticks out to them that they'd like to suggest or... Yes, I'd like to see the uh, golf course taken out of this. I'm not happy about uh, the golf course being included because I think uh, the clear implication is in the language that it's, uh, we're, we're uh, going to uh, ultimately sell the golf course uh, so, so that we can build uh, shops or, or, or other things on the dual highway and I don't think that's a wise, I don't, I don't want to go in that direction. Okay. Uh, quite frankly, I like that green space on the dual highway. Uh, and I think it does a good, I think it does a lot for the, for that end of town. But more specifically, here we are, we're talking, we've talked several times this evening about health in our community. And I don't, and here we have a, 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 an entity, a golf course, which in and of itself provides health in the community for those who use it. And I really think the language in this uh, impl implies that <coughs> We want to get rid of the golf course. I don't. I mean, I can't read this any other way. I've tried and tried and tried, and I am vigorously opposed to that. And um, I'd like to see the golf course taken off this list and the golf course considered in a separate in a separate way um, to uh, try to assure its long-term survival. Would it be? reasonable to keep the first part to determine the long-term financial feasibility of the golf course and strike the end of that statement because I do think I mean we've talked about it before about how we're subsidizing it to the tune of about two hundred thousand dollars a year I think um, and so I do think it would be good for us to keep staff focused on finding ways to enhance the operation to keep it uh, at least to be able to sustain itself financially. I, the marketing has not been on for a long, 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 long time. <coughs> and until you get the marketing where it should be, you're not going to see any money that's going to turn over. The reality is the golf course has around 11,000 rounds of golf a year in the current economic climate. I think at the best economic climate, it probably had 15 or 16,000 rounds in its best year. It needs 27 to 28,000 rounds of golf to break even, or basically three times the amount that it has now, and that is not going to happen. Uh, and I don't see that amenity any differently than, you know, the 60 to 70 grand that, that we spend on the pool for people that go to the pool or, or, or other types of park facilities. Uh, so while I understand the, the notion that, you know, we, we need to, to, we need to market it better, we, you know, we need to get, get play up and things like that and, and you know, have it more financially stable, uh, the, the reality is, you know, it, it is that type of amenity and 
I don't have. So you don't think it's reasonable to think that it's ever going to be self-sustaining? It'll never be self-sustaining. No way. Never. I, I don't think it'll be self-sustaining any more than the pool will ever be self-sustaining. Do you agree we should strike it from our our uh, stated goals I, and priorities here? I, I think for, for, for my vision of how East End should be redeveloped, it plays an integral role to that redevelopment plan. And, and I, I will continue to support it. What I think that has to happen is the same thing I told staff six months ago when we went out and toured it, is that it plays like it played 50 years ago. And the game of golf isn't played like it was 50 years ago. And so it needs some, what I would consider to be cosmetic uh, improvements to improve play that might boost the rounds, but, but it isn't ever going to be self-sustaining. I don't uh, think it'll be self-sustaining, but I still think that there right. is money there to be made off of it. And I, and I, you're, and I think Penny's right. Huh? I mean, BlackRock, I was told today, BlackRock continues to increase their fees. If your other golf courses are doing it, you know, uh, this is probably the only one that's really right on. A lot of golf courses are going out of business, yeah. actually. Uh, and, you know, we probably will have to subsidize it. Mm -hmm. But we have the sons leaving, so. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, well, if they have anything to do with it, they're, they're going to be leaving. And. I, I just, we have to have some amenities for the citizens. And this is a, is a, this is a good one, this is a health amenity. And uh, quite frankly, if it were advertised enough, as Penny's been indicating, yeah. it probably would increase the number of people who play golf. And it's cyclical anyhow. When, when Tiger's playing well, golf goes well. And there's gonna be other Tigers come along. Um, and and I, just, I just think that uh, the prospect of closing it down is, is, the wrong, is the wrong way to look at it. Any other thoughts on that subject? I, I just have an interest in structuring the discussion of redevelopment of the East End, I guess, differently uh, than uh, how it's structured here. Any other what, no, what are you saying? I don't understand. Um, well, we talk about the stadium, uh, you know, the fairgrounds park, and the, the greens at Hamilton Run uh, as, as sort of, you know, what I would consider East End. And I guess I just have, you know, and I've shared with everybody sort of the vision that I have for that area. Uh, and, and that's the discussion I think that I, I think that, I, that I know that I would like to have about what I see are the potential values of, of making that, you know, and sustaining that as a recreational corridor uh, for the community. Um, you know, I've talked about, you know, we just had a presentation at EDC last Thursday, uh, and, and it's going to happen. I mean, an indoor turf facility is going to happen somewhere in this county at some point. There are various groups, and we will kick ourselves when it happens out along the interstate when we've got a great. Uh, 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 potential pieces of real estate right in this uh, area okay. for that type of thing to occur. And I think that only will boost the benefits once MELP's gone. It will boost the benefits uh, of use at the golf course. It'll boost the benefits of uh, connecting uh, youth recreational activities at the fairgrounds. So I guess I just see moving Kristen, our tenants in that direction. We had a brief conversation last yeah. EDC uh, meeting, I just, and I agree with you. I think so you're saying it all that fits together. under public facilities and infrastructure to frame the development viability or repurposing of these certain properties, to sort of frame that mm -hmm. in an overall East End corridor, recreation corridor, if you I will. do. Kind of like the urban partners. I, and I think it's I, I just, trying. I think East, East End is, is sort of this post-industrial complex where it's going to be changing. We're spending money to change it, and you know, these things are going to happen. And I think we need to have a plan, a, a bigger plan in place to, to you know, uh, uh, be ahead of that Instead of looking at these individual Correct. places, I would look at, you know, yeah. You have Winter Street Elementary School, which is obviously West End, but these other things are all an integral part of an East End development well, scheme. 
So we can just restructure the way it's formatted mm -hmm. here to focus. In, right. In the lead bullet. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Move Winter Street out as a separate bullet. Uh, that, that's what I think too. You know, right. and I think there you're covering the East End and you're covering the West How do you feel about golf course strike? And it. then mentioned East End, as Kristen says, in, in the first bullet, and then including, you're not limiting to the things of municipal grandstand, but. Or, uh, including projects such as or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, Maybe I think it's important to include the specific things yeah, you're looking you, at. Yeah, you still include those three. We're looking and at. under Greens at Hamilton Run, I just say uh, explore means of improving the uh, financial feasibility or something like that. I, right. that or self sustaining. Or even including the goal. comments about enhancing the playability or how Well, you that would too. That. that would be one of the means, though. Right, enhancing. Seems to me. Yeah, if you're going to keep that, I get rid of the word determine, input, improve. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. I, I, I think improve. based upon past history, unless you have a, um, a very strong vocal component cool. of our city coming in here screaming that it's time to stop subsidizing golf play mm -hmm. and get rid of the golf course, that, that that's not something that I would want to entertain. And, and i tell you the more important reason. Um, Councilmember Munson mentioned it. I, I'm not a real particular fan of spending $200,000 to subsidize the golf course, okay? Um, but if we have a golf course here, what, what's the thought process of what we're going to put there? And if what I'm seeing is just another golden mile or continuation of commercial that eventually becomes vacant and sits in an eyesore, I, I think that this is a better use of that property than Unless somebody were to come to us and say, we got this grand scheme of what we can do with the golf course to make this community perfect, that's one thing. But just to say, let's talk about what are we going to do with the golf course now, I, I agree with uh, Councilmember Munson. Well, you make a really good point. I heard on the radio yesterday that 44% of Christmas shopping this year is anticipated to be online. How long is it going mm -hmm. to be before the commercial Nobody's areas? Nobody's building walls anymore. Yeah, exactly. So you make a really good point. All right. It sounds yeah. like there is consensus. To yes, I Mr. Brubaker. A suggestion for the East End, and I know it, it's a hot potato, but I think we should put in, because it's a key site, and it should be work with or coordinate with, or it shouldn't be assist, but Meredith Medical Center on determining redevelopment of the uh, Meredith sites. It's not just the hospital site, Dan. That's right, the they 19 acres. A lot acres. of property of the Meredith's own properties. I don't quite have the wordsmithing there, but uh, that's, those properties are so critical to the East End. That Do we believe put that? A bullet. It doesn't imply that we have, the wording shouldn't imply that we have responsibility. Do we put that in public facilities infrastructure or under economic development? I uh, know, under the East End uh, sites, the East End Mm -hmm. Issues. That's a good idea, Mark. That's a fourth think, bullet, a fourth uh, sub bullet, or whatever you want to call those things. I think they own 13 acres yeah. with about six acres of privately I mean, held property that all scattered fits in into between their figuring out the east end. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good idea, and I think that plays a role in. And Kristen's, he, he can say more about this if he wants to, but I think it plays a role in oh, I Kristen's, Kristen's yeah. comments a couple months ago. Yeah. Well, the bottom line is, if you're talking about East End, you have a huge number, not a huge number, you have a huge amount of property owned by a number of different owners at all, whether it's the paper plant, right. or which the paper plant is also an essential thing to try to figure out what to do with. The hospital is an essential place. The county-owned properties in Baltimore Street are part of all of this. And, and I mean, the entire, that whole East End redevelopment, you can put as many bullets as you want under it, but it all gets down to a comprehensive redesign of, of what's out there. Right? Yeah, and Town we run. need to pay for the land that we mm -hmm. don't own. Right. <clears throat> okay. Which uh, I think will become a hot discussion mm -hmm. when Melp's gone. Mm -hmm. Right. How are we doing this discussion? We're going page by page? No, we're just bringing up items that are hot buttons it's good. for people. For the so first we... page, last item. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want that to be interpreted that this council has voted to approve those funds. Mm -hmm. That they, that they, I don't know whether they're penciling, I've asked several times whether they're penciling those funds into these things that they're talking about outside this venue or not. But 
this council hasn't approved the, those funds. Correct. And uh, at times, I, I'm not so sure of the value uh -huh. of that concept, you know, as opposed to other things we might want to invest in. So I'm not, I'm still out, jury's out as far as I'm concerned. Well, that's, there is a joint meeting scheduled with the Board of Ed on December 16th at 4 p.m. right here well, after it, they have a discussion with it, the county it commission. It might be, so but it I, is see, an I don't want them, discussion. I don't want them reading this and saying, well, we're going to count on that million and a half, that's all. Right. Well, we're just in the discussion phase. Okay, well, as right long now. as that's Well, clear, I think we all want to support this project. We do. Whether we want to support it with a million and a half dollars is a whole different story. I mean, so if it was I, I don't mind supporting the project, but I also am not willing to send word that this council is going to take a new step for municipalities in the state. We took one new step for municipalities in the state with the library. But I am going to be asking the Board of Education to supply to us the name and projects of municipalities in the state that have contributed seven figures to county Board of Educations. Yeah. So I think we're far away from We can hold this one in abeyance support. until we actually have this discussion. I think yeah, we're, I we're thinking the next idea. two years out. So and, uh, uh, whether it's supporting them through the yeah. the West Antietam Street thing that we just did, you know, that I would consider that support. It, it, but it is vague, and uh, we haven't finished that discussion. I do recognize. Well, to, to me, a key factor is the Maryland Theater piece, mm -hmm. and just saying, oh yeah, it'll tie into that. I'm afraid we'll, we'll put our, all, all our uh, uh, money investment into that mm -hmm. and not have anything of something like the Maryland Theater materialized. If it was a combined joint project, I could be enthusiastic. But I'm afraid we're going to be left holding the football if, uh, mm -hmm. uh, on this one if we're not careful. I, I, I think the, the big picture here is not only with that, there's got to be, you know, I don't know what our goals and priorities are as it relates to money. That, that's, I think, the issue. And it's not only this, but participate with the county and the private sector in constructing the extension of professional court against Antietam Creek and the annexation development of Mount Etna Farms. I, I think that's great, but if it involves indicating that we're going to do financial support for that, you know, I, we need to we need to identify what we're talking about when we talk about doing these things. The same thing with uh, redeveloping the Massey, the former Massey property, uh, county-owned property. I mean, I I just don't want to send a message when we do this that the city is getting ready to expend a whole lot of money to build a bridge on property that we don't own. Actually, I think the key point with that is not us paying for a bridge, the key word in that bullet is annexation. I agree with you. And, and so if we don't participate in the conversations, we don't want to be left out of that discussion because I don't want it to be assumed that we're walking away from a potential and, annexation. And I totally agree with you, Mayor. I couldn't agree with you more. And and I wasn't going to bring any of these up until Councilmember Brubaker did, because I agree with what he's saying about the education. Mm -hmm. and, and I. You know, I, I, I just, I don't know how we word things to say that we want to support these projects and work with, but. Well, I don't think any of these imply any promises. Okay, the words fine. participate and support, I mean, they're loose and vague, I think, for a reason. But they are goals or priorities, I think, that we should be looking at and certainly should be participants. Well, I just think that we have enough on our plate that we need to take care of what we have so far because when I heard goals on here, I mm -hmm. thought, and what are we going after? I mean, we've mm -hmm. got so much looming out here. It's mm -hmm. on our plate, urban partners with what yep. urban partners wants us to do. And then we have this whole list of, and yep. I'm not saying, We're hey, juggling not, watermelons you know, here. really, <laughs> I mean, really, it is like, yeah. okay, mm -hmm. no, it's a little overwhelming. Yeah, I mean, Sorry, I, I'd, I, would al I would almost be in favor, and I, I agree with where this is going, and I like the, the, the flow of conversation of on these larger items, just listing them, you know, participate uh, in, in, in the discussion of, you know, these, mm -hmm. these four items. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Instead of wording what we're going to do, mm -hmm. we're going to participate in, in each one of those. Right. And they, they, don't, they don't directly city related. Right. There's other things that I think are listed here and fleshed out 
are things we're doing no, uh, independently yeah. and, and, and directly. And but those larger ones we're doing right, yeah. right yeah. now. Right. And, I, and I, when I look at when I look at almost everything else on this list, other than what we've discussed right now, we're we're actively doing right. That's things. our stuff. Yeah, we're mm -hmm. actively solely. Doing. Well, that's right. I want to continue to list them. It just needs to be absolutely clear that we're not committing to anything right. until our goals are met. And I, uh, we can all look at that. Okay, and I, and I agree with that. That's what we need to do. We're going to take all this feedback and re re redo it, rejigger it, and come back and present it to you again. Any other hot buttons, things that stood out? Good things, bad things? Anything in between? I think a uh, big priority for me, anyway, is the technology piece. And you heard me mention something about the mobile friendliness of our website and uh, getting the gig, I think, is huge. I think that's listed under economic development. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but it really cuts across all the different sectors, whether it's economic development or uh, transparency and efficiency in government, uh, citizen based government. I think. The technology piece is really crucial to everything that we do. Scott's keeping up with all this. In addition to all the the efforts at community engagement, um, obviously with neighborhoods being a whole um, aspect of our goals, uh, and again, a lot of these things are things that we're already doing or things that we're planning on improving, um, but all good stuff. A couple times we mentioned, you know, the, the state as a partner because it's going to be a you know they're going to be crucial in terms of some of the funding or uh, or other aspects of these these goals. So, anything else jump out at anyone? So we come back on December second. We can come back. The phrasing of some of these yeah, items. If, if anyone in the meantime has any thoughts or library meeting. questions, uh, let me know or let Scott and Aaron or Bruce know. I think that we need to. Uh, formulate some direction on who our audience is for the public safety component specifically as it relates to um, uh, the proliferation of uh, different types of assisted uh, living facilities and services uh, uh, in the community. What do you mean? Well, uh, you know, we've obviously, it was no secret, we had discussions of the change health systems, and we've had discussions of the gatekeepers mm -hmm. new program, and we've had discussions of, of you know, uh, the, the uh, expansions at um, uh, the W House and, and the Hagerstown Housing Authority with, with uh, 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 the redevelopment in addition to Nolan. I just think that, <laughs> I feel like we, we have a lot of discussions with a lot of different entities and we all sort of recognize what the issues are mm -hmm. and the imbalance, frankly, that exists within our community to, to, to you know, uh, be stable enough to, to sort of uh, uh, have the adequate level of services that care appropriately uh, without being overwhelmed. And I, and I think that, that you know, a lot of folks would agree, you know, our urban area is overwhelmed uh, when compared to other uh, um, you know, yeah. similar sized communities. Would we be addressing and, and that? And I just think we need to figure out some way to, to get to an audience or the right audience of people to, to have that discussion. Well, and I, I don't think we've gotten there. In terms there's, of a, there's a bullet on, these pages aren't numbered. But yeah, under public the, safety. Under neighborhood, well no, under neighborhoods there's a bullet that talks about key issues, concentration of property, well, Nonprofit subsidized housing, concentration of I, social services. I feel like those discussions under neighborhoods is more for the impact that is being experienced by the citizens in those neighborhoods. I guess what I'm talking about is on the public safety one, uh, uh, when it talks about, um, uh, and I hate to use the word management, but, but, but sustainability of, of some balance in this community of, of the degree to, to, to which we can handle uh, various uh, um, uh, public subsidy services. I, I don't know how else to put that. And that would fall under the public safety category. I think it does. 
In you terms know, when, of when I when I attended that meeting up at uh, uh, what was it up Saint at Mary's. up at St. Mary's on that gatekeepers program, I will tell you, I left a meeting like that having a completely different perspective mm -hmm. of my feelings within the room than a lot of folks that don't live inside of these city limits right. that had an idea of how to facilitate that in this city that were in that room. Right. And and our 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 communication on that issue is not it's not on the same same page, it's not on the same wavelength at this point. Well we can try to tackle that one and and uh, address that under public safety. We may be calling on you to get more clarity on that particular matter. In terms of, you're, you're saying who is our audience, what do you mean in terms of uh, like how we address that problem? Yes, how we address it. I don't think that we understand it enough at this point to address it. Like I don't think that we know the level of service uh, growth or even if we do uh, out understand there, it, how much DSS control we have and with DJJ it. and with Potomac Case Management, mm -hmm. with Reach Shelter and with W, I, I just don't think that we have a good handle at this table, at this table or around those discussion tables of those issues of, of the impact that it's having on the community and the balance to which we need to achieve so that this community isn't overwhelmed uh, by uh, all directions. Okay. Thank you for that. Any other feedback? I think All it was right. a good list. It, it, yeah. it got a good discussion going, so the bullets were there. All right. We'll bring it back then in a couple weeks. All right. The next item is speed camera information. Next couple items. I appreciate everyone hanging in there. Did you bring in a sample, Mr. Brubaker, that you'd like to share with us? No. Are you contributing to the fun? <laughs> Can we check those records, Chief? <laughs> yeah. Hey, I do raise our revenue. <laughs> For the record, I haven't gotten one. <laughs> <laughs> You funny duddies. You funny duddies. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Uh, evening. Michelle and I are here to just to go over the contract. We brought a new contract back to you that, that meets Maryland law. And then we want to uh, go over some of the program totals and projections for the last couple of years. It's still a new program for us, and we're still uh, learning our way through the, the, uh, the numbers. The first one is the, uh, the contract. Uh, this, this contract I have... Uh, before you is with our same vendor that we're currently using. We've been with this vendor for since the start. Uh, it's Breckford and uh, they're out of Hanover, Maryland. The, the big change in the contract which was uh, uh, facilitated by the new Maryland law which was to get away from the uh, fee per ticket. In other words, you can't split a percentage of the ticket with the vendor and then the city keeps a percentage. So we had to change the contract to a flat rate and the way to do that is to more or less lease the equipment, at least each uh, of the camera boxes that we have or the camera equipment in there. Currently we have 11 cameras that are operating in the 13 different uh, school zones that we have. So we have more boxes out there than we have cameras and we do move the cameras around from box to box to keep everybody honest in the system. But we don't need a camera in every box. So what we're doing is uh, we looked at last year's uh, uh, fees that we, that we split with Breckford and uh, it's, it's uh, Breckford's uh, participation in this is, uh, you know, why, why so much money? Uh, they, they do own the equipment, uh, so we'll be leasing the equipment in this. They're still going to handle the back-end processing, which is the uh, payment uh, processing that goes out and the collections that come back in, and then they uh, filter that to the finance department. That will still take place. Uh, the Hagerstown Police Department are still the operators of this program. And new this year also is what they call an ombudsman, which is uh, supposed to be an independent, has to be an independent person. Uh, it can be a, another police officer, but it's not involved with the program that serves as a liaison with the community. So what you don't want to get is uh, be able to call in and, and get lost in, in the mix if you have a, a ticket that's, uh, that needs to be fixed. 
and you might not necessarily want to talk to the person that approved that ticket. So you'll be talking to the ombudsman. If you look right on our website, uh, that person is Lieutenant Woodring, who uh, manages that part of the, the system for us. But the day-to-day -day operations are still done by uh, Tim Rossiter, who uh, works in uniform in our square. So this contract, uh, uh, getting back to the contract, will be a flat fee. Looking about uh, at uh, section number three under compensation, what we did was we looked at last year's uh, revenue that we paid Breckford. It was uh, four, just over $480,000. This uh, at $3,500 uh, per camera if we kept it at $3,500. Uh, in other words, if we kept 11 cameras all year, we would actually be paying less uh, this year. We'd be paying just slightly less at $462,000. That's if we keep all 11 cameras. So we're going to monitor each camera and see if it's worthwhile keeping 11 cameras. Maybe we uh, pare that number down. Uh, and uh, and save that $3,500, but that's a decision we get to make. The contract's flexible enough; we can do that. We're paying on a per camera system, so it's uh, the big the big number there is $3,500 per month per camera uh, as we keep it. The uh, I'll just call your attention to section number or be on the second page, be in section four, about halfway down the page. It starts with contractor will collect monies. Uh, what we're talking about there is uh, there's still a split uh, fee for the tickets that are still kind of coming in. So if, if we approve this contract, uh, there is still that split fee that's, that's still being paid out on the old tickets. Uh, the second paragraph down there, it starts with monies uh, outstanding under the contract, under the old contract. This is the um, unpaid collectibles that are laying out there. So it's, it was part of the old system. We felt our vendor did have a, an interest in that. So uh, what we agreed to here is to split any net revenue collected from that old, those old monies that are laying out there. They're, they're still yet uncollected. And it, just, just okay. one quick, quick note on that. At the end of um, fiscal year 14, as of June 30, that number was $790,000. That's outstanding unpaid tickets at that point. So in, in the last uh, big bullet point here is the contract term, and this is a two-year contract with a uh, two one-year automatic renewals unless we uh, stop it. So in essence, it's a two-year contract, and we feel that after another two years of this at the flat fee rate, we'll get a better understanding of uh, uh, whether that's a, a good number for us to rent with or, or not. What are, what are the back fees owed us? Back fees. Right now, at the end of June, we had $790,000 in tickets that had been issued that it simply hadn't been paid at that point. And as um, Chief was just describing those couple of paragraphs there, as Breckford collects that monies, that monies will then be split. They will still I, get I their understand. old percentage of the 39% versus the new $3,500 per camera. That's a lot of money. Why is it so high? Delinquents. You, you, you know, it's um, it could be uh, some of it's out of state. It's just uh, a lot of it gets placed on the car, so it gets they will get flagged eventually if they're going to pay their tag, renew their tags. They'll have to pay that, get that lien taken off, that flag taken off their car. Um, so part of this will be discussion of. Uh, where do we go from here as far as collecting the rest of that? And how is that accounted for on the the seven hundred ninety thousand? How is that? Is that where it's reserved for uncollectible? Is that? That's part of the number. Yes. That's part. Of, so it just accumulates based on each. Correct. Year so the that goes by. So to to flip on the safe speed for school program, if we look at the fiscal year fourteen actual results, there's a number there reserved for uncollectible. So of those seven hundred ninety thousand, there. Were New in fiscal year 14, we determined that or estimated that another 230,000 of that would not be collected. And that's based on age, how old the tickets are. Um, is, is there, are, are there serious efforts to collect it going on? Breckford handles those right now. Right. What we did, we, we send the initial three letters out, and then after that, they do get flagged. There's a late fee assigned to that, so they can't renew their plates. Uh, what we tried after that was a series of three more uh, mailings that went out, and we right. were able to collect some of that, but we weren't that successful. The next step is to is to get a policy in place internally to move all that money towards collections, and that's that's been some discussion we've been having with uh, Michelle. Uh, 
uh, under the flat eat. fee thing, who's going to pursue that? Is it still going to be Breckford? And what motivation will they have if it's a flat fee? No, it, it's going to be us. And, and that's what Maryland, the okay. Maryland law did. The Maryland law shifted the, all the risk from the vendor to us. When we started this program out as 100% risk-free, now it's 100% our risk. So that's what the Maryland law did for us. So, um, so now now we have to we have this flat rate, and then and then it's going to be up to us to go collect this this money. But Breckford will still be handling all the initial invoicing and issuing yeah. and, and mailing out of the citations, as well as sending out three notices in an attempt to collect. So when the chief says, when you say you're you got to figure this out, you really have to figure it out because it's in your ballpark now. Absolutely. How are we going to do this? Okay. Absolutely. Why aren't you so, sending and, them, why and, chief? Why don't you, aren't you sending them to collection agencies after a certain amount of time? Uh, that's just policy within the city. We're we're looking at that. I think oh, yeah. that will be our next move. But uh, that's that's to be fleshed out with our finance department okay. on on the best way to do that. It's I agree that uh, we need to go after this funny money. Otherwise, the system doesn't doesn't have the uh, impact that we want. That's true. Is everyone okay with a new contract then? Yeah. I just, I have a question about the chart. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, we have 600,000 that we budgeted for contract charges. Yes. And that, that was on collections estimated of 1.6 million, let's say. Yes. Not forget the late fee revenue. Mm -hmm. Correct. Or count it, 1.8 or 1.6. Now our new projection is 1.448 and uh, with a net of 1517, and yet our, our, our uh, contract charge is still $600,000 on that much less collection. Because it's gonna be a hybrid, and until we get a little bit further along in fiscal year 15, I didn't feel comfortable changing that number for you right. until we come back to work, to work budget time. So, so in a couple so, more months, we'll, we'll have a couple right, more. Right, you're so, I just wanted to hear you say, you're being conservative. Being very might, conservative. That might, number might go down. In increasing should. our net there should absolutely that number should go down correct okay and, well, and what we did in this to um, just to kind of give everybody just a quick overview and looking at the program again as chief has already commented and, and we've had conversations with um, Bruce our city administrator this program is still so new and one of the things that we have to remember is that we just started this program April 2012 mm -hmm which was the last two and a half months of fiscal year 12. In fiscal year 13, we, throughout the year, phased it so that all these 11 cameras were operational. So fiscal year 14 is our first full year, really, of having 11 cameras in place every single month. And what we're showing and reflecting on here is fiscal year 13 actual, fiscal year 14 actual, and those numbers will be reflected in the care for presentations that we bring back in a couple weeks. But basically on this i'm strictly showing safe speed for school programs so within hpd chief has a division a department if you will he has patrol he has safe the safe speed for school program and here is strictly we're showing the revenue that was and the tickets that were issued so 1.45 million in fiscal year 14 was issued based on how much remained outstanding at the end of the year and we take a snapshot we are estimating based on the age of those that another 230,000 would be unable to be collected. So that brings us down to um, total revenue of 1.2 in this specific program. Directly in this department, we pay Breckford, who's our contract person, we paid them 482,000. But also within this specific department within HPD, we have staff, we purchased a vehicle, we have some other direct expenditures, and that's what you're seeing in 178,000. That means net, when we look at just this department, we have $565,000 on a year. And what I've done at below in the footnotes is list for everybody what we use that money towards. So just because this specific one shows a net impact addition of 565,000. We have to remember that with an HPD division, their fiscal year 15 operating budget is 12.6 million. So from the 565,000 that we um, had as a surplus within this specific department, we were able to do across the HP division hiring incentives. And those incentives included monthly housing allowance and one time $5,000 sign on bonus for eligible employees. Um, 
we when we did the first cops hiring grant that was the 2012 cops hiring grant that was for five positions and our general fund match for those positions comes from here that was 25,000 for fiscal year 14 we were able to purchase uniforms for citizens on patrol we did additional funding for a children's village right. program and this was, these well, were all things that were brought back throughout fiscal year 14 I, I'm Council. not a yeah, right. I'm just trying to yeah. police academy training costs. This is an excellent program. This is a very good use of our safe speed for our school program. Oh. $72,000. And I think Chief would go Right. That's another direction. thing the public yeah. doesn't realize that these funds are plowed into the police department. At, within public safety. Within public safety. So, Correct. But the more we can net that's why i'm asking you about the contract the more, cost correct the more there is to do things otherwise we might have to fund with the general fund you know so you know or not, be able public to or not be able to do so keep getting those tickets marty and that's helping <laughs> out the <laughs> um we purchased uh, yeah yeah but again so i just kind of Put some notes here so that we didn't lose track of what we used that five hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars. No, thank you. So that's that's the highlights uh, of our where we're seeing our program and trying to guess our best projection. The contract meets uh, our our Maryland law that's in place now and actually exceeds it in the areas of uh, testing the equipment. We added some of that in there to make sure that we're testing our equipment twice a year, not once a year, and uh, and doing going above there. So. I feel comfortable with this contract. Great. And just, just one quick thing. Sure. Uh, Chief, could you repeat the uh, the days and the hours when the, this program is in effect? Sure. The program's in effect Monday through Friday, and it starts at 6 o'clock in the morning and runs till 8 o'clock in the evening. And that's all year long on holidays and on snow days. So pay attention out there. If it's Monday through Friday, you're going through our school zones. Those cameras are live. They're, they're, they're working. And we just encourage everybody year round to pay attention to the speed limit and uh, and and obey it. To just um, to you also wanted me to mention, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry I was just going to say, just to emphasize, it's not in effect on Saturday and Sunday. It's not. Yeah. And there's still an early payment option uh, so on the back of, if anybody does get those tickets, uh, look on the back there. If you pay your ticket within <laughs> seven days of getting it in the, po in the mail, there's a $5 uh, uh, deduction from that. So we're the only program that I know of in the state that, that will allow you a little deduction for paying early. So, reminder there. But the fact is, this program works. And I'm not talking about recovering money. But those of us who live in this town all our lives, mm -hmm. all you got to do is drive that more than half. Right. Same program works. Drive down Northern Avenue, what used to be 40 to 50 miles an hour is now 25 to 30. Mm -hmm. and, and it has worked and it's accomplished its goal. And eventually uh, we'll really start losing revenue and that's fine because we'll stop speeding. And uh, I think it's been a very positive thing. Very well said. Thank you, Thank you Chief. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Chief. And we'll bring this back then. Yep, I'll contact some for next week. Right? Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. All right, last but certainly not least, our yes. trustee communications <laughs> manager. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. Hello again. <laughs> All right. We already got one yes. <laughs> yeah. We've got two yeses. We've got three We've got yeses. Got a third. <laughs> okay. Marty, how about you? All right. Would you like to just briefly tell us what you're going to be doing, Ms. Wolf? Yes, um, we would like to build a video production studio within designated space in the Elizabeth Hager Center. We have a nice open space that we'd like to build some walls around, put some uh, video production equipment inside and make it an efficient space whereby we can enhance the quality of our video productions, have a greater variety, and turn those productions in less time. So we have worked with a design professional and we received an estimate for about $40,000 for construction of the space. Um, we would like to leave a little bit of room for contingencies as well. It would be paid for with PEG fees through the cable franchise agreement. And so we just wanted to get uh, 
go ahead to release an RFP for construction of that space. Is there going to be a uh, studio in there where you can actually interview people? If you recall, when we uh, filmed for State of the City, we had the green screen, we had all of the lights. It would basically be a space where we could fit that equipment permanently. Right. Uh, to keep putting it up and taking it say, down. Air casing is such a good sport of taking it down and setting it back up. That little card, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Have teleprompter, cameras, mm -hmm. all that good stuff. And can you just briefly update the council on what's going to happen with the cameras and all the other improvements here in the city, also using PEG fees? Yes. Uh, so the new equipment has been ordered for council chamber. Uh, the vendor will be coming in uh, this week or next week to get a more definitive timeline of the project. They originally estimated seven to 10 days for installation of the new system. We also have to take some time to uninstall the current equipment. We're going to be bringing the cameras down so that you're not looking at a descending angle all the time, but probably at a, a feet around, or a height around eight feet um, instead of where they currently are. We're also gonna get column style speakers that will fit better with the architecture in here and we'll also be able to pivot them so that we can fill the sound throughout the space and have a better quality sound in here. Um, we're getting new microphones, and we'll have the television sets installed on the walls. And also something where you have like the touch screen interactive type of thing. I don't possibly. think we have that. Scott was talking about exploring that, but oh, there's okay. nothing in that in this particular proposal. Okay. All right. So you're really going to bring us into the 21st century? Huh? Yes. Okay, good. And we'll have a plan to uh, update the equipment as technology updates so that we don't have one big reinstall like we're doing this time around. Thank you very much. Thank you. And look at that. We're just about on time for city administrator comments. Uh, just a heads up, if you're uh, still raking leaves or if you're asked, our last yard waste pickup in the fall is the week of December 22nd. So we still have a ways to go. This time of year, we start to get inquiries. And uh, so it's the week of December 22nd. It's the last yard waste pickup. Next week with Thanksgiving, the uh, collections on uh, Thursday and Friday will be pushed back one day because of the holidays. So next week, collection days, if your collection day is Thursday, your collection day is Friday, it gets pushed back one day because of Thanksgiving. That's it for me. All right, thanks. Mr. Metzner. Mayor, I have two things tonight. One, um, is, uh, or both of them are very nice. Uh, as Councilman Brubaker would know, for years I used to, around the Christmas holidays, talk about you got to shop downtown and you got to do this and you got to do that. And I have to tell you, the last couple of years I don't recall having a lot of those statements because, candidly, we have lost a lot of our retail. But with two weeks of pop-up shops coming, I got to say, now is the time to shop downtown and, uh, you know, go buy yourself city center dollars, get a 20% discount, shop all weekend and eat and take advantage of the discounts. And uh, if you want your city to be what you want it to be, come on down and be part of it this weekend and next weekend. That's one thing, and the other thing, and hopefully the city will be doing an official press release and big band and brass and everything else, but it has been a long time coming. Um, the League of American Cyclists has officially named uh, Hagerstown as a bicycle-friendly city, and we have achieved um, bronze medal status. That sounds like a nice thing, but I have to tell you that the um, Bicycle Advisory Committee, along especially with staff, has spent tens if not hundreds of hours. If you would see the application that has to be filled out, uh, it is many, many pages long, and it is not simple, and there are a lot of things that have to be done. And we've tried to achieve this goal for the last three years and have not been able to. We've received honorable mention status. And uh, the fact that we are now a, a bronze star, a bronze medal um, 
bicycle friendly city is just another one of those things we will be able to put along with our main street city and other things and uh, it's something to be proud of and staff has done a lot of work to get us there and I want to congratulate them. Thank Indeed you. and you stole one of my things that I wanted to talk mm -hmm. about but I'll just reiterate and thank again uh, the Bicycle Advisory Committee and especially Rodney Tissue are the world's best city engineer and Alex Rohrbaugh and our planning department and I know the there's a new bike map out as well and um, it's got some cool uh, additional features on that so it is a very well earned and uh, a designation that makes us very proud. Mr. Brubeck. Well, last week I got to fill in for the mayor at the 20th anniversary celebration for Da Vinci Interactive. You know, it's a firm I knew was up there on the 28th. Last week I filled in for the mayor at the 20th anniversary of Da Vinci Interactive. I knew it was up there. What a great firm, what a great operation. You know, talked to the staff, had a great time looking at what they're doing. Um, the city staff did a good job with it, but um, my point is, and I talked to them about it, they have a lot of clients down the road, as we say. They have the human genomic uh, experiment in Rockville. They have the Smithsonian Institution. They have all kinds of folks down the road, and I talked to them. How is it uh, working in Hagerstown and, you know, having that interaction? No problem, you know, they, they didn't have to go down the road that often. When they did, it was fine. Uh, their clients don't mind. Most of it's electronic. Uh, they have a great relationship, I mean, and, and they're very successful. So those are very credible statements. And it was, it was so impressive to see uh, that firm and, and hear its story, by the way. They had a good, great tape of the story. So thank you, Mayor, for giving me that opportunity because I really learned a lot and, and I, it really, tells me that my instincts that we can recruit and bring them up here if they know what we have and, and know what they're missing from, mm -hmm. from down the road. So Especially I, if we have the gig. Yeah, and, and uh, High Rock and other, uh, there's maybe some others I'm missing prove the same point mm -hmm. when you talk to them. Well, thank you for covering for me. And yeah. it's always nice to share the fun and the heat. Right, uh, yeah. Uh, and the second thing is the electronic disposal. That was great. I wound up kibitzing down there and uh, I offered to help, but they had enough help, so I just kibitzed and uh, you know, harassed uh, the city administrator when he drove through and others. You know. <laughs> so, um, but it was great. That's and true. I got, uh, and <laughs> attics, basements, and rec rooms throughout Hagerstown are in much better shape today. That's if only say. my stuff would have gotten yeah. there, but someone dropped the ball on that. So. Okay. Mr. Alshire. Um, I, I noted to you before the meeting, and I don't, the chief has gone. He's back, he's back. Oh, he is? Oh, I can't see him through Mark. Um, been up your way a couple of times over the last couple of weeks. I don't know whatever that intersection is behind your house. but Prospect of no kill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I almost got hit twice there. And it, uh, at nighttime, I think that those stop signs turn into yield signs mm -hmm. to, to people there going through. There are no through, crosswalks so. either. No, there are no crosswalks. No designated and, crosswalks. And the median strip that's right there uh, between uh, the intersection, there's no crosswalk through them. Like when you go Park mm -hmm. Circle, there's little areas there they have crosswalks mm -hmm. that go through. So yeah, you you pretty much walk out into it. But mm -hmm. yeah, that, oh, yeah, I definitely that was, <laughs> wait. <laughs> that was an experience. Yeah. Um, and uh, just to reiterate, uh, there was a gentleman that came to our EDC meeting last week, mm -hmm. um, I believe from the Williamsport area, uh, again talking about an indoor turf facility uh, uh, to be located in this community. I know there are at least two other organizations that have had um, uh, similar discussions. Uh, everybody knows my feeling on the issue uh, and, and, you know, like all things, you know, the discussions will turn into reality at some point. Uh, and as the, the hub of not just this county, but of the, the Cumberland and the Martinsburg and the Chambersburg uh, tri-state area, um, I, I don't, 
I don't want to see us uh, miss out on an opportunity that uh, so many other communities uh, have capitalized uh, on the success of, whether it's Gettysburg or Frederick or Winchester uh, or Westminster, uh, all of those other jurisdictions uh, have facilities that our kids go to uh, every week. Also, uh, last night when I was walking, there is, the car must have completely wrecked and rolled and landed in the spot on Summit, right next to the county building, whatever that little car, uh, 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 whatever that car, car shop is, uh, automotive shop, but it's sitting out in the sidewalk. Uh, and it is, it looks like they drug it here from Grimm's junkyard. I mean, that's the condition what? of it. But it's literally sitting Talking in. About a car on a sidewalk? Oh, it's, it's sitting, it, whatever that, that uh, I don't know if it's a dealership, I think it's like an auto repair place right near where your office used to be, around the corner. It looks like we have about 30 of them in there, but this one looks like it, it just got dropped from the wrecking ball. I mean, it's, it's bad. Um, and uh, also, don't get me wrong, I fully, fully support the bike lanes. Um, I would only note that, that as we do these, that we make sure that we leave adequate travel width for, uh, you know, uh, vehicles. Uh, I know on Walnut, I, I get squeezed down a little bit uh, from the ones that we just put in there. I don't know what the minimum widths of travel lanes are. I obviously drive an, an abnormally larger vehicle, but um, I just want to make sure we're aware of that uh, because I don't want to create a condition where, you know what I mean, the bike and the car are competing for space simply because it's not uh, uh, there. And then I was wondering if we have any Speaking of, of uh, leaf pickup, we don't have any regulation, I guess, within the city for uh, leaf collection, right? No, uh, well, like in front of properties? To, to use our recyclable bags. We won't pick yeah. up plastic bags. Are you talking about how the people people blow them out in the street or what? Yeah, blowing them out on the street, blowing them out into the sidewalk, uh, and then they sit and they rot and they, they lay on the sidewalk. And there are some places I've, I've passed that are, are just completely covered. I mean, you. Yeah, it's, it adds to the, I think, uh, you know, Little negligent building. condition of, of, of the property. When you talk about the Ted and things like that, you know, it's one of the things I think you don't notice, but, it, but it's there. I, I would imagine in, if you have to remove snow from your sidewalk, I would think at some point you have to remove leaves well, from your sidewalk. Well, eventually you remove Yeah, eventually. Right. Well, right. Before I, they all fall. Yeah, right. and it, it's interesting because when I was through Williamsport the other week, they have the street sweeper that goes through, but they actually blow the area on that particular street the morning before the street sweeper goes through that particular area. Does that make sense? So they blow the sidewalk off of the leaf to bray, no, into the street, and then the street sweeper comes down the street and picks they it up. They do that every so. day in downtown. Yeah. The, peop the public works comes out and blows off the sidewalks, mm -hmm. and then the street sweeper comes and yeah. picks it up. And then... Speaking of filling in for, I don't think we've had a meeting since then, but I did, I was able to fill in for the north-south uh, right. gridiron yeah. uh, um, trophy. Um, south High 1? And south High 1, so it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was a good day to give the, it was a good day to give the trophy away. Uh, we'll be know. having those guests next week come to our <laughs> yes. meeting so for the MVP it, presentation. And it was all positive. There have been years I've been there and, and, you know, the cheering, you know, gets, gets, Degraded, especially after a score, you know, get, gets uh, abnormally large in one direction or the other. But it was all positive, which they're was, hearing our message, which, which was counts. good. And, and yeah, and, and the rivalry is is a healthy thing. I think that it's good for the community because after the game, everybody, you know, yeah. So thank thanks. you for doing that. Yeah. That's all I have, Mr. Munson. No comments, Mayor. All right, I would uh, again like to. Uh, congratulate staff and the Bicycle Advisory Committee and everyone who has a part in uh, this very nice designation that we've got from the uh, League of American Bicyclists and also want to remind people about how Hagerstown is ringing in the holiday season. Our tree lighting is of course this Friday at 7 o'clock at Public Square uh, and of course the pop-up shops start at 4. The tree lighting is at 7. Uh, and that at 8 o'clock at the Maryland Theater is the 25th annual Holly Fest. So, of course, it would be great for anyone who would like to to come out and see that. 
uh, at 5.30 on Friday, beginning at 5.30, both the North High uh, Brass Band and South High Brass Ensemble will perform, uh, perform in Public Square. Girls Inc. will serenade onlookers with Christmas carols. Uh, it's just going to be a great time uh, in downtown this Friday. So don't miss it. And with that, we will be adjourned. <laughs>